This is episode number 39 of the Leggett Podcast with myself, Tom Wickstead. It's me, Andy Grant, and this week we have got Lee Butler. How are you, boys? Good. How are you? Very good indeed. A little bit <laughs> nervous, and I got a cold sore as well, I thought. And I've seen a few camera clips, I'm being a bit of a spice boy. <laughs> got me L'Oreal. Got me L'Oreal face tan out before and stuck a bit on before I come. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. mate, I'm, I'm buzzing to have you, mate. I feel as well like I've... I feel I've got a few different relationships where you've got this. So we've met a couple of times, but I feel like I've got this one as a teenager growing up, just hearing your voice for fucking years, and then knowing you as, as, as Lee Butler, and then also knowing more recently, like this other side of Lee Butler as well. That's kind of come out as well, where you've been, been much more than honest. And then through social media interaction, we've got that kind of social media yeah, friendship yeah. as well, where you yeah, kind yeah, of, you know, right. you, you, you right, have a yeah. bit of back and forth with someone. So I've kind of known you from afar and then seen a change and then I've known you through social media and again, through the gym and what I have you. Know, what, the, what the first thing you said, I'm, I'm very lucky in that sense where lots of people feel like they've grown up with me, even though they've mm. never met me. Mm. And I'm very, very blessed in that department. Was If it wasn't like, for lots of people grew up coming to the early nightclubs, whether it was like the State or the 051 or the Buzz or the Paradox and, and watching me play and, and being part of them nights, or people listen to me old dance shows of a weekend. Mm. And like, I, whether it was people who were in Nick, I used to have a huge following in, 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 in jail. Really? With yeah. Their phones that used to text in. Oh, it was just insane. I well, I used to have like a radio or something in the prison that yeah, people listen to. Yeah, they were all good. Yeah. But yeah. the back, this was like probably 10 or 15 years ago when I was doing my weekend dance shows. But lots of people used to listen to me of a weekend. So you bump into people and they go, oh, and it's like they know you, which yeah. is lovely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've had so many people like that who said um, he'd been on the podcast. It, who I suppose have been on TV and things like that and people just come up to them as if they just know them because they've spent so much time either listening or watching to them watching them yeah. and it feels like but you know nothing about them Do you know, it's such a mm. weird like, no I know and it's, not, it's nice I mean it's not like getting mobbed or anything yeah, like yeah, that yeah. but it's people who like music just in a priest of music in Liverpool and, and like in club and we're very very blessed in Liverpool to have a, 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 so had such an, an amazing Clubland, like history of like iconic nightclubs and really and lots of these people growing up, Andy, and they were like passionate about their Saturday nights. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so like they take that passion into into their later life, and it's mm. a very big part of them. Whether it was Cream or the O Five One or the State or, or the Quadrant Park in like mm. nineteen ninety, which was when I was first like got hooked by it all. Yeah. That to me, that part of my early raving years, eighty nine, nineteen ninety one, is just like. Well, so I, special I, mate, that, that rings so true what you said it was only must have been last summer I was in the camp and furnace with Tony and and, um, and you were on stage and I was with a girlfriend at the time and her uh, mum and dad uh, and they're, they're, they're only early 50s um, your girlfriend? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah her mum and dad early 50s and auntie and uncle the same and um, it, it was funny I said uh, we were round by the camp and furnace way and I said oh, I, know, I know Tony Tony Clark who's it's his event he's put on and he went, what, that event in the camp of furnace tonight with Lee Butler and all them? I said, yeah, yeah, well, I know the lads who are, fuck off, you can't get us in there, can you? So anyway, rang Tony and I was like the fucking hero for getting us in that night. And, <laughs> but again, they were loving it. They, they were like straight back to what you've just said then. It was just throwback to them, to those days. And you don't realise how passionate people are but as they get older in life. It's, it's still blessed there, in the it? city to have that though. Do you know, like, even, you know, I did a, an interview with me dad for someone else, the two of us together, and we were talking to like, my dad was talking about like, the cavern, and even when you go further back, Liverpool's just got such an amazing history of, mm. and it means a lot to these people, and especially when you get a bit older, like I'm 49 now, so, but lots of people who are in the 40s now, or they've got three kids, and they don't get out to, to go out a mm. lot, or go clubbing, I should say, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, like, yeah. and, they hold on to them times, and especially the music. And there's one thing that music can do: it's transport you back to a oh, yeah. to a place, do you know, and a time, and 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 certain friends, and certain podiums, or anything. Mm. They can really transport you and paint such a colourful picture. Music can, and yeah. Liverpool's very lucky in that sense that lots of people lived. I did. I fucking hell, I used to live for my Saturday night when I was like 18, 19, and mm. I was like the acid house music kicked in. I was like fucking everything just got dropped. My tools, my lechy, my sparking, fucking everything just went. <laughs> She went off the rails. Yeah. What eighty nine? When was the um, the time where all the illegal raids were? Was that then? Yeah. Yeah. So I left out. school in eighty six, and and like I had, I was brought up in Eighton, so I went to like Malvern and Page Moss around them areas, and then my dad must have got like a pay rise because he went from like he's the only one who's been from Radio City to Radio Merseyside to Radio City and back to Radio Merseyside. So we must have constantly getting getting double <laughs> Good double idea. bubble. Yeah. Right. So we moved from like I was like. Leading goal scorer for, for the for the school, playing for Eighton Boys, and like 
bit of a playboy in school and he took the fucking lot off me. We moved me to an all boys school. So there was no girls. He plays rugby. Yeah. He took me footy and me women off me. <laughs> and me teenage years. And I was like, I, was, I remember I was crying my eyes out. I was going, please. We moved to Blundell Sands. Did you? Yeah. yeah. And like, so I went to St. Mary's College then. Yeah. For my last few years. And I just, I must have just, it must have just been fake that he didn't want me to have a, a school with girls in as I was getting into my yeah. like late <laughs> teens. Yeah. Because the year I left, he let girls in. I was going to say, because it's mixed now, it isn't is, it? It is, yeah, yeah. But he must have waited until I put a go first. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> we've heard about him. Just but I, the girls I left out. school then and I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was like, you know, I'd done a, a, um, a sparking course at, at Ubed. Um, and then. What were you like academic wise? I mean, were you bright? Were you. Not really. Oh. No. No. I was, I was all right. I wasn't bad at English. I passed me English. It was all levels then, wasn't it? Mm. So it was like, you had one chance to pass. Now it's sort of like lots of coursework and stuff, yeah. isn't it? You can make it up if you don't do too good. But mm. I passed me, um, me English and believe it or not, I passed me religion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like, not don't know anything about it, but like when yeah. you got a multiple choice, you could yeah. either write an essay on like something <laughs> really like, you know, the breaking of the bread. Or you could write an essay on how society can help older women or, or old age pensioners, and I just took all the other ones on. Because I was good at English, yeah, I passed yeah. me religion, so everyone thinks, "Oh, yes, he, he died at Calvary and Nazareth." And like, <laughs> I don't know. But when you're going through, then if you're not, I mean, was music a massive thing for you then? Um, you know, looking back, I did a podcast, I started a podcast. I did one Dave Graham the other week, and we were talking to Dave about like things that sort of inspired us as we were growing up musically. And obviously, as you can imagine, with me dad being on the radio all them like from when I was a kid mm. he had the, and he had the breakfast shows on both stations so he was constantly playing music whereas n now I'll get music sent to me f to listen to to play at gigs back then it was all vinyl mm. so like he used to kind of have great memories of me dad when he was in Knighton in Pilch Lane we lived it's just off Pilch Lane and he'd just sit there with his going through his playlist and it'd just be stacks of vinyl Mm. And he'd just be sitting in with the record player in the living room, just skipping through tunes and, and then going through his mail. Like, so it's like, everything's digital now. If anyone wants a request, they text in or they email you in. Yeah. Whereas then, it was letters. It's just like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds <laughs> of letters. Dear Billy, dear Billy. It was just like mounds of them. And he'd be going through them all and writing, I've got a can't even imagine that really. There's me requests. Man. And he'd, he'd sort them into requests and birthday requests and, and like weddings. And it was just mounds of mail. It was just insane. But... He was always, always playing music, always. And even from like a young age, I can remember like when I was probably 12 or 13, I had like this white Bush MIDI hi-fi, like 50 watt hi-fi and I bought a little mic and plugged it in. And I was like, used to play like Bobby Brown and Luther Van Dross and people like that. And was, what, when was Radio Caroline? Was it Radio Caroline? I'm not remember, sure. No, the, remember the, the name? Was on, on the boat. They had a boat and they set out, set up because they were, they were out of the, the UK shores. Never heard of Radio Caroline. I've heard of it, yeah. yeah, but yeah. It, I can't remember what it was. I thought it was around your time, but no, no, no. Not that old. Jesus. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, I only asked about that, mate, because I remember when, again, we grew up, grew, growing up, kind of getting to 15, 16, and, and again, you're always on the Saturday night, and it was always your music, but I had a mate called Darren, and he had his decks in his bedroom, and it was all that kind of thing, and I'm just wondering, was that you, kind of 15, 16, yeah, 17, on the decks? And yeah, so I got my first set of decks. So well, it was like 1986 when I left school. The Quadrum Park, which, which became like the biggest iconic sort of breakthrough acid house rave club in Liverpool, which was in Bootle. Mm. Um, do, you know, do you know where it yeah, was? Yeah, yeah. As you've yeah. seen, it's not there yeah. now. But, um, so it was on like Derby Road, mm. like Bootle, past Waterloo as you go into Bootle. And, um, but in 86, it was like a Shannon and Tracy club. It was amazing in there. And um, Charlie C was the DJ. I don't know if you know Charlie. He's, he's like legendary soul DJ. He's, he's boss. But it was like, it was a Shannon and Tracy club. It was locked out then. So we used to get it be able to get in there when I was like 16 17 and then it, it it became an acid house club and that's when I got the bug and I was 19 when I got my decks 89 I got my first set of decks and it's just like used to persecute my mum and dad my dad used to just come and say stop I think you've had the same song on for fucking four hours <laughs> <laughs> it's just this beat don't you play nothing else I was like, yeah, yeah. but for you then it was it was a kind of your what were your influences then? I'm guessing then, if you the music was it just this this new breakout thing, and it was it, it, to be honest, yeah, so it was almost I mean, trailblazing in a way yourself, kind of thing. Would you say that? Like, it, yeah, it, it's like I always I was always 
massively into my music and I was always sort of messing around with little bits, not so much software back then, but I'd have a mic and I'd be presenting I was on the radio and stuff. So it was in the blood, maybe, you mm-hmm. know, like, but that whole acid house scene, it was like, in 89, 90, 91, when that kicked off, it was like generations were just, just swept away. And like, it was every generation. If you went to Quad in 1990, and then you only have to YouTube some of the clips, it's just like, it's like Robbie Fowler getting the winner in the 95th minute of the Derby. Yeah. It, it, it's like, it's just going off to yeah. tunes like you would not believe. It's just, it's insane. What's it called? The Quad? Yeah, the Quads and Park. Get um, up on YouTube. It was that YouTube, yeah. <clears throat> so if we go to that enjoy anthem there. This one. Second one down. Yeah. By the way, people on people on YouTube can see this. So. You'll know this tune, Andy. That's what I think's mad about me, though. I mean, I'm 31, and there's some songs that come on, and they just seem to be iconic Liverpool songs. Listen. So this is I that. Brought I'm in love with you. Won't you just love me too? It's one of the biggest tunes. But you're right. That was 1990. That. Someone's man, who's brought a VCA. See that big fella in the middle? He's a yeah. solicitor now. It's what? He's a, he's a solicitor. Is he? Yeah. <laughs> but me, look at that. Yeah. You just don't get that no more. No. no. It's like being at the match but, that or something, isn't it? It's yeah, that kind of match. What you're saying it. is, that tune. Are you better now over weekend than that? Yeah. Kind of, yeah. That's like, so generations. That sort of era was a massive part in lots of people's generations that never even went there. Mm. Because when I went there, and I was watching Mike Nolan and John Kelly and, and like James Barton was there before he went on to go to the cream, and I was just gobsmacked. And like, you know, at that point, the drug scene was massive. Mm. You know, ecstasy was huge. I mean, there was lots of peep things in the paper, and Margaret Thatcher was, I was like big. And that's why all the, all the raves and the illegal raves started getting shut down because they were linking it to ecstasy and stuff. But there's no getting away from the fact that 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 early scene, 89, 1991, was just like, was very heavily led by ecstasy. And like, mm. if you were taking it like I was at that time, they were just mind blowing nights. It was mm. just like, it was like, ev- everyone was swept away by it because now you know that tune. Mm. because you've been brought up listening to it. Back then, we, we'd we never heard none of this music before. So, like, the reason this music built through is because the younger mums and dads have been playing this, so they're younger kids. Like, if I play Three Years Family at, a, at, a, at an 18th now, all the kids know it. Yeah. But it's from 1994. Yeah, it's mad, that, isn't it, I think? But because their mums and dads have played it, and they all know every word to it. Mm. Mm. But, but then, in, in 1990 and 89... It was just this whole new sound of music coming from like America and Italy and like Italian house and and this whole new like lasers and lights that we were just like, wow, what's what's going on here? Yeah, I always remember. Is it Frankie Knuckles? Yeah, your love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that Chicago house sort of. Yeah, it was with like yeah. Morales and, and Sanchez yeah, yeah, and, Morales, and yeah, all yeah. like Steve yeah. Silk Hurley and all that lot. They were like early pioneers. You're talking. You're going back even further. Then you're up like eighty four or five for them for them guys, but. That's sort of what where it led from. But back then, you had everyone from like lads on the dole in there to like lawyers, yeah, all just round the pent. <laughs> and, like, and the fact of the matter is, just everyone was best mates. Yeah, you were like no fights. He wants no. to go on holiday with each other at the ends and everything. You fucking <laughs> sharing shoeys. Anyone will need a ciggy. We used to come out and just walk around the club for about an hour. Yeah, just gangs of us talking, just like. <laughs> You know when you're saying then about it was kind of new for you. Obviously, with your with your dad being heavily involved in music, what was it? Was it ever your dad that thing where you know your dad just doesn't understand what the music Absolutely, is? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And me, me dad, and he still doesn't. He just, he just says, he used to say, as I said, he used to say, this just sounds like it's all the same. Yeah, it's just like this kick drum and like nothing's the same. I'm like, what are you on about? Yeah. So the piano breaking that and that vocal, he's like, <laughs> yeah, but it's just. <laughs> Where's the soul? He was yeah. going like, yeah, yeah. Did you ever go over to Hacienda? Did you ever venture down? I went to about the Hacienda or? once, and that was sort of the same time as the Cotton Park, nineteen ninety one. They were mm. not so much rival clubs, but Graham Park, who was on the Hacienda. Hacienda was, when I say cooler, I don't mean cooler as in it was a cooler place to be, like a hipper place. But the music was was a bit more soulful in the Hacienda. Right. So he'd be playing sort of Ten City. That's the way love is, and and like more American house whereas mm. the quad was just like Liverpool full on as you can see yeah 
Italian house, acid house, acid acid riffs, tougher, harder. Um, whereas Hacienda was a little bit like houseier and funkier. So they weren't really similar in them ways musically. Mm. Um, but like everything, the quads, you know, people look look now and say there's loads of crime and there's and like it's dangerous to go out. But you know, the quads in park got shut down for them reasons. Really, in ninety one. Yeah. You know, like violence and really yeah and drugs so people forget because there's no social media back then and stuff like that it's you know there was i think it's that nostalgia thing isn't it when you always look back and you think of the it was better then yeah it was all yeah, yeah. you're right you're right and people do fall into that trap of thinking it was better I think then that's what most things in life. i mean you look at football you look at rafa benitez and you think wow amazing you know but there was a time at the end where you're like fucking hell rafa what are you doing here lad exactly you know what I mean? and yeah. things do run the course they yeah. do they do but that was a very very special two years where and that was me then just like and is that what it was to that culture where like it was that that kind of it say you know 89 90 and it was literally for you every what friday saturday was a type thing like Andy, literally honestly mate <laughs> i would have sold my nan to go really yeah honest to god i would have sold my nan to go there some of the stuff i've done to get the quads because i had no money oh well it's told it told me told, told me all these <laughs> So, so me and Lee got a, a very good mutual friend, uh, Tony Clark, and he's uh, been with him in the gym last couple of weeks when I knew you were coming on. And he's like, Andy, ask Lee about this, ask Lee about that. Uh, so I'll just say something if you don't want to go into the story, we don't have to, but he, he mentioned that um, one of those old whiskey bottles. Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to make... It's you don't gonna, have to say it It's going to make me sound like a proper smack at this. <laughs> Which I was, which I was. A proper you don't have to say it if you don't want to. Oh, I'll tell you. So, <laughs> I hope my Mars ex fella's not listening. <laughs> so, my mum, my mum and dad had split up, mm-hmm. right? So, we was living in um, Nosley Village. Yeah. My mum had this uh, bungalow in Nosley Village. And it's probably like 1990, I reckon. And me and I, Stuart, my older brother, so obviously he's my older brother and I like I love him to bits and he, I idolised, I still do. And so me and him were like raving partners. So I was like 20, he was 26. So we're off the rails, do you know what I mean? I'd lost my job. I'd left two works vans. In, I, I left one in Blackburn. <laughs> I forgot I'd gone in it. So we drove to these illegal raves looking for these warehouse parties and you'd follow the convoy car. Hell. And so after the quad had finished, we everyone used to drive down to somewhere called Steve's Garage, and there'd be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cars, all with the tunes on, and the whole car would be shaking. And you'd how be, are you driving down here if you're all off your balance? Mate, I don't know. I don't know. It's it's you know <laughs> it's, well, it's not good, but it's just how it was then. Yeah. And there used to be one convoy car. There was a guy called Walshy, and he was, <laughs> was about six foot six, and he had a red Fiesta. He ba- barely fit in it. He had a big, massive what we call cat wigs now, but yeah, he had yeah. one then. Yeah. Big, massive perm, and he used to get the tip. Of the, and what happened is a car had come past, and you'd know the reg. You'd all know the reg of the convoy car, and that car would know where the rave was. So then we would drive up to like Warrington, Winnick, like uh, Charnet Richard, looking for these illegal raves. But in the end, the police used to get wind of it, so they'd cordon the turn off off, that they knew you were going to turn off, so the police would be there. And so there'd be hundreds and hundreds of cars, just Fuck all hell. like, absolutely buzzing. Yeah. <laughs> just like, we could have drove for hours, I wasn't asked if we found it, I was like, oh, just carry on driving. <laughs> but we, we find them in the end. Um, and I left one, I left, I left there, the red mini Metro. And my dad bent me onto this guy, he had a mating form, but he was an electrician, he had his own electrical company, he must have said, listen, I'll leave can you look after Ali she said yeah yeah she must have thought ah Billy will give me some plugs on the radio I'll give Lee a partnership <laughs> so it's called D&B Electrical Services Dwyer and Butler it was and I, I couldn't even wear a house at the time and I was like on all these buildings these like mad nursing homes and, and I was like fucking hell and my dad was like I teamed you up with Vince from Formby he said your partner's now it's a really good opportunity for you I left the fucking first van in Blackburn <laughs> after one of these raves yeah. and then he got me a Peugeot too. I said it, I said it wasn't me so I must have been robbed out the path <laughs> and I had Peugeot 205 I, I, I lost that as well I left that somewhere and just come home without just because you go on the raves and then you're getting up the, you're obviously after just the going rave had finished you just forget it you took it the morning, we were just like with a gang of lads or girls and we just all be talking and go yeah we're getting the bus we're getting the coach coming us and I'm like, oh yeah it's sound and I get home and go fucking hell the car's there <laughs> oh, yeah, so no. just sacked me no sat nav then either no just like <laughs> I just got sacked. So go on, how did that turn into the bottle there? So, at the point, at that time, like, you know, 
I look back and a lot of, I speak a lot about my recovery now and I'm like nearly three years clean and, and I spent a lot of time in recovery and a lot of time in, in, in counselling and stuff like that but I won't not talk about it. it's pointless yeah yeah not <coughs> talking about some of the fun times I had as well because mm. that's it exists yeah so course, yeah. it's it's already saying how painful it was and it was but that was painful once it used to become abuse mm. do you know like I was using and taking ease and I was going out and having a ball. Yeah, what? I had no responsibilities then. Mm. But that did lead me onto addiction and mm. not being able to stop no matter, no matter how much I wanted to. And, and like the ease led onto cocaine and that's a totally different drug. And But yeah, back to the back to the, the story. <laughs> my mum had met this new guy called um, Mick. Yeah. Right. And we had a really bad temper. <laughs> so when he got a cob on, he used to, you knew he had a cob on because he'd get really polite with you. He wouldn't swear. He'd go like, excuse me, please. <laughs> Lee, um, come here, please, thank you. And you'd go, fuck. He's starting to get polite, I'm in trouble. So he used to keep, you know them big whiskey bottles? Yeah. So he used to collect pound coins. I don't know if they were pound coins, but well, oh, it might have been 20 p's. I'm sure the pound coin was, I can't remember, right. But he used to keep them. And me and our Stuart were like, because he was my man's new fella and he was like, he'd started staying in ours. We were like, I fucking like him. <laughs> <laughs> Get off me mum. Right. <laughs> and so he had this bottle, this whiskey bottle full, full of pound coins. A couple of quid, isn't it? Right, yeah. And I asked Stuart, I'm like, I'm going to put it on him. <laughs> so he went, so he just weighed that in. And he was like, nah, you can't do that. Just, just, and he was like, let's just weigh it in. We've got no money to go out. I'm not going to be able to go to quad this week. So I mean, so okay, cast it in <laughs> top of um, top of Bolt Street, up by the law courts. There was like a, a place opposite there. I think it might be still there. You just like take money in and we cast it in there. And it was just went absolutely <laughs> off in my mum's. <laughs> it went off in my mum's, and like our street was a bit of a it was a, it was a bit of more of a case than me. I was a fucking wimp. If I got put on the spot, I just buckle, and he just he knew, and he went. I fucking telling you, like it, no matter what gets said. You don't know nothing about this. It's the first time it's ever come out. Tonight, so you die. <laughs> Honest to God. Playing Tony Clark, not me, lad. But this is the first time it's come out, but but yeah, and he, he, he I remember him getting me in the car, Mick. Saying, yeah. Mick, if you're listening to me, I'm dead sorry. It's 311 quid, I'll give you the back. <laughs> <laughs> I swear, getting so to messes me online. I've got your money there, I'm dead sorry. And um That's got, what it was like, though, you're just desperate to get he out got like. me in the car and he went, listen, he tried to double bluff me. Your steward told me, lad. Your steward told me, he said, um, but I too want to hear it from you because, you know, I know you've been through a lot. I know your mum and dad have got divorced. And he threw me down this big mad mad. I was like, <laughs> I was that far from going on. I was, yeah. I just held my nerve until now. There now it's go. out. <laughs> <laughs> now it's out. Grant's go. got it out me. But is that what it was like though? Just kind of that big bottle steel. I need to be there yeah, every week. It was, you know. But it was like, <clears throat> we were queuing off them. And the thing is, now if you're going on a, on a night out now, Andy, it, it, it's like everything's pre-planned. Mm. If you're going out, people are booking booths, they're booking the rail. Mm. Yeah, yeah. You buy your ticket. Back then, and even after that, when like the state and the 051, Saturday night it was it was clubs were weekly then, so you'd go there and there's a chance you wouldn't gonna get, you ain't gonna get in, and that was horrifying. But that's what made the excitement even yeah, yeah. even better because you were like you were in the queue. Mm. Like that's gone now because people have booked the table, they booked the booth, they booked the ticket. Mm. Every, not knocking it because yeah, yeah. times change, change and yeah. people say that to me. Oh, I'll get all them with the cameras out, film and stuff. But I have a good argument to say if we had, thank God we never. But if we did, <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Then. Photo. Um, I've, I've never phone, heard that argument. If we had phone cameras back then, would I have videoed some of the special moments? Yeah, do I wish I would have. Yeah, I do. Mm. Mm. So you got like. A, Lots That's of good people. Point. I've never thought. Lots of, like of people that, yeah. are like stuck at the, in them times, and like it's never as good. And look, we were there because of the music, and yet we were. But we didn't have camera phones then, mm. so you can't say we wouldn't have used them because. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do think there is something. I know what you mean, and I totally agree with you. I do think there is something so romantic though about those times of not having to pre-plan stuff. And I always think, imagine how many. Just me being a fella, being a compared, thinking about women like. But I just think, imagine how many. <laughs> Imagine how many birds you've met there and you've went, right, I'll meet you here in, like next week or something. And then, because there's no phones, like, you just haven't. Like, imagine how many birds that like relationship that could have could yeah. by. <laughs> <laughs> no, I always think of that, you know. I know. I know. But, but, you're right. but everything was, 
everything was there was more emotion to it all. Mm. You know, like we go to quads and we were outside for eight o'clock, and there was people coming from the quads and park from all over the country. Like it was the <laughs> it was the biggest breakthrough asset house race club. It was. It was two floors, it was 2,500, and Jimmy Spencer... 2,500? Yeah, two floors, and it was full by 10 o'clock. So you chance you weren't getting in. And, like, not only were you looking forward to it all week, and, like, I mean, you only you only come around about Wednesday from the Saturday before, <laughs> yeah. and then you just start to have something to eat, and it'd be, like, Friday night, and you'd be like, here we go, yeah. we're going again, yeah. we're going again. Yeah. And that's just how it was then. Mm. Um, Do you and, think the drug scene is, is still is? think it's as prevalent as it was then or even more or worse or there's just more I, media around it or um i don't know i don't know it's it's changed you know i mean it's hard for me i start part of me is always now i've opened up about my recovery is it was weary of talking about lots of the, the old times and 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 opening up and saying I did enjoy it because sometimes I feel like people think, oh, well, you can't say that because no, I mean I think. But, it, but, you, you but I, I'm not. I don't want to sound like I'm <laughs> condoning it because I know where it where it took me. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It, and like, so I, I don't know. I don't mm. know. I mean, nowadays it seems like when we were going out in eighty nine, nineteen ninety one, we were taking ease. That's what we were taking, mm. and like when we were drinking water, yeah. we didn't. I didn't even drink then. Really? Did I did drink? drink, but it wasn't about drinking. Yeah. And, like, that's what we were taking. And, and did the music just go hand in hand with ecstasy? Is that what it was? Yeah, maybe. And, like, there was the Summer of Love in 91, and it was just, like... This is just this. literally, like, promising the world to total strangers. Yeah. <laughs> that's this, what they say, though. I've never actually talked ecstasy, but that's what they say. You just love everyone. It's just everyone's it's just, just like, happy. So that's what that scene was. But then cocaine became a lot more prominent and a lot more prominent for me. And it's, you know, like... When did cocaine when, start to... Rip? When people say it's, it's a social drug... It's just like for me, it was just the most antisocial drug they could ever be. Like I had nothing to say for myself. I didn't want to be around anyone. I, I wanted to go home and get more and snort in the house on my own for days and days and days and days on end. And like it's just like that's it's just massively antisocial. And I think because cocaine's a lot bigger now and a lot more, I'll say it's normalised. But mm. I haven't been in the industry I'm in. It is quite normal. Mm. Like you, uh, well, I mean, I'd say it's normal in just. I mean, you could uh, most you, pubs and most yeah, things now, uh, which is everywhere. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not saying everyone's taking it, but uh, you, you can be, you can be quite under pressure if you don't now. Mate, you know what? If I, you're in with, the, if you're in with the circle, yeah, yeah, yeah. especially in, in the club scene. Yeah. Do you know, like I know from when I went into, went into recovery and, and when I was when I was I was really fighting hard to stop and I was struggling, and obviously my job didn't help. But when going to work or going out, everyone's on it. Mm. Putting it in your hand. Do you want one of them? It, it's like, yeah, it's tough. And like, the it's thing, even more normalised now. Mm. The thing that's surprising is, um, I, we, I was always told like, you know, smoking weed's the gateway into everything else. Whereas for you, ecstasy was the, like the gateway into yeah. it, which is... Yeah, I've never smoked weed. I mean, I've had a spliff, like yeah. when it's been at parties years ago. And was like, mm. But because I didn't smoke, Mm. Maybe I mean it's just like I used, to, I used to amaze me. I used to see people smoking full spliffs, and I'd be like, I'd have a drag of it, and I'd be like, fucking Ian Bolton would whack me over the head with a crisp bat. <laughs> I used to be just like on the deck, wiped out off of a drag. Yeah, but that was like that was a long time ago. But so in the nineties, when when you're there, Quadrant Park, and you you ecstasy, and then was the cocaine then come along straight away for you? Was it or um so? The quad finished in 91, and then I knew then I wanted to be a DJ. I'd had my decks a couple of years. Um, I was doing mixtapes, it was back then, and handing them out to people. And I got my own little kit. And I started going out doing, like, mobile, just mobile DJs. I was, I had a residency in the Phoenix in Canny Farm, which is a pub and cancel farm. It's not there no more. And I used to be there every Saturday. And, uh, or I used to, I used to do um, Heighton Labour Club. I think it was a Duffcott Labour. It was on Finch Lane. In in Aiton, Duff got ways, and it used to just be like playing like Jimmy Mack, third finger left hand, like come on Eileen, mm. but that was getting me my money to go to buy me vinyl, <coughs> to buy me house, and buy me Italian house music, and like I was just obsessed then with getting somewhere to play, um, and we were all still going out then, but ninety one two sort of was more like the state and cream, and, and James Barton obviously was a big part of of, of, of like 
the Codson Park, and then Codson Park was the first place to have an all nighter. Jimmy Spencer, we clever man, like he's still he's still alive, and he's he's an old man now. He's he was a multi millionaire then, but he um he's managed to find loopways in the law, <laughs> so like he found a way to open this all nighter next door. It used to be the snow if you remember this. It used to be a, just ended up being a snooker pavilion just next behind the quad so by the firehouse and where flames used to be and all that there so we he, t- he turned this warehouse for four thousand people into an all nighter till six Jesus. so we go from the quad to there to mm. there till six and then believe it or not everyone used to go to mcdonald's no one had a fucking thing there <laughs> i swear i've got pictures of me and mackie's like with a big head like something our brother beyond like a big spice boy quiff and like We'd just all be sitting there, and the whole of McDonald's would be full, and no one would be eating. I'd think it's just all talk and not wanting to go home. Yeah. <laughs> it's mad, so, that, isn't it? Then after the quad, all them, you know, Cream was 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 born uh, from James Barton. He was he was at residence in the all nighter in the Quadson Park, and him and Andy Carroll started Cream, and Cream started, and the state obviously the state was the state has been there all them times that the, the that the Quadson Park was open. It's just that the state in like sort of eighty six, seven, eight, nah, it was playing playing new romantic stuff like the Smiths and New Order <coughs> and like mm. you know like um the Clash and like stuff like that. Um and early acid house stuff. The quad was really the first one to break it through and then the state was like with Davy T and stuff and I, I first got I got a, my first gig in the state in like ninety the end of ninety two. And it was still ecstasy then. Really, mm. it was still ease, and, and and that's that's what we were doing at that point. You're you're at the age though, mate, where you're so impressionable to all that, aren't you? At eighteen, nineteen, that's just a, it's just a, whether it was lucky or unlucky, that was just if you were into music and you you were there, you were susceptible yeah. to that, wasn't it's, you? See, when I talk about, I mean, I do. I only post every Sunday because I don't. Wanna, I'm conscious of like annoying people on me on my socials which is constant recovery stuff so i just save it for sunday and i always do a couple of posts on a sunday and i offer people the chance to get in touch with me and via email and i've got a massive email folder now full of people who, who reach out because there seems to be a st- there's still a little stigma about addiction people think smackhead mm. thief fucking that's his own fault and i'm not saying it's, it's a very Tough debate that with self inflicted people think, well, you fucking don't take them. Mm. But you can easily be swept away by us and mm. not be a bad person or a thief or <clears throat> and just and trying to hold on to a normal life and mm. a marriage with kids and, and the amount of people that I'm, I, I speak to and, and message me and email me and I try and offer them some support and point them in the right direction and just give them some techniques to help me is mind blowing. I mean, you're mm. talking for mums of. of 20 to mums of 40 to men to really? young lads to parents who worried about the kids who are asking the kids can you speak to me it's like I'm, I'm not passionate about helping others now because I know how hard it is to stop mm. especially with cocaine especially with cocaine is that a, th- is that a thing of um, well, actually on that point I think I read something that they did a study with mice and uh, they give the, the mice the option to have water I think sex and there was something else and obviously cocaine and every single time the mice will have the cocaine until it dies over anything well, that sums addiction up yeah <clears throat> and like <clears throat> what people come to me and I write about in a different way because I write about it very real and in real terms and in real words so that's why a lot of people connect with the way I write them because I write about the paranoia I write about and, and lots of Partners will message me and go. I feel, like, I feel like I feel like I've just read everything about me about how my partner is right now in mm. what you've just wrote on your wall, Lee. Like I can't get him to stop. And like, is that is that stop as in like throughout the week, or is that as in like they just can't stop the party on a weekend, or is that like people thre- think the, the word party sort of it comes strips out of it once 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 you, once you addiction takes over. Right. There's no party in there. Mm. I could be out with the lads when I was like at the height of my addiction. It was and it was cocaine. And and drink could go with that heavily drinking. I'm talking like because the way cocaine got me was was like I couldn't wait to go home and get it. It was just me and me, me and me, me and me drug on my own in ours. And bear in mind, I've got a wife and three kids at home, and they were young at the time. And like the dad's downstairs in the back room for two three days drinking bottles of vodka, bottles of brandy, Jeez. cans of cider, anything. And I'd have a team of people who drop anything off for me. And it'd be like two o'clock Tuesday afternoon and I'd be getting like more dropped off 
and my missus would be going out and I couldn't speak. I'd have nothing to say. I'd be on my own. I couldn't look at no one. I'm paranoid. Some of the thoughts are like, are just horrendous. Just and the come downs. Desperately, desperately wanted to stop. Come Tuesday, I'd be sobbing. I'd be in my mum's or something. My bed would kick me out and I'd be in my mum's. It's crying my eyes out to my mum saying, I fucking hate it. I hate feeling like this. I hate doing it. I, I hate it. There's not How old are you, Lee, when this is going on? 35. Yeah. When I really knew I fucking couldn't stop on my own. Because this is like what I always try and get across to people. It's a very different technique. I, I got taught a, t- a technique by an, an American guy who was like a breakaway from AA. Yeah, I've heard you talk about this. So it's, it's, it's a lot, probably a, a lot relatable to like a couple of other books that have been written that aren't written about addiction. It's just the good and bad. And it's just when you've got an addiction, lots of people who I'm speaking to now and I, and I, and I, and I talk to about this technique. They're amazed. They go, oh my fucking God, so I'm not going mad. So this voice, this addictive voice that I'm hearing, that's, you know, like it gets a Thursday, Friday with me years ago and I, I, I promised me missus and I'd say, I promise you love. And she'd go, I'm fucking had enough, like, fucking Tuesday afternoon and you're fucking messaging me while I'm in work and you bring us ailing. Come on, fucking, she said, I can't handle it. Fucking the kids, I'm saying it to the kids, you can't go in the back room, your, your dad's in there. And like, what you've just said there, where you put you put you put your drugs before anything else, and you do mm. when you're addicted, and you just all you're asked about, and it's sad to say, but it's true. It it comes first, and when I explain this a technique to people, it's called AVRT, and it's just called addictive voice recognition technique, and it's all about recognizing the difference between the right inner voice and you and the part of you that's crying on a Tuesday saying, I fucking hate this. I want to stop. I don't want to do this anymore. I can't stand it. I'm not enjoying it. I'm paranoid. I'm skitzed out in the house. I'm drinking straight vodka. I'm having palpitations. I'm breathing into a fucking bag on a fucking Monday morning. And then as soon as my heart starts being normal, I'm fucking snorting cocaine again. What? Why? I hate it. I'm going to kill myself. I want to have a stroke. I'm not going to see my kids grow up. I'm lying in bed on a Tuesday with the weight of the world on my shoulders. Fucking with the worst thoughts. And then come Thursday, I'm getting these thoughts again. That voice these again. These addictive thoughts. Mm. Thinking. Just have a little go Saturday. The fucking boxing's on. Liverpool playing the matches on. They're all going to fucking Tommy's. That'd be good, that. Just go and have a couple. Just have a few. Just don't go mad. Don't go mad. Just have... A couple. Tell your bird you're being by 11. And just come home at half 10. That's your addictive voice. Mm. And it's learning to separate that from you. The part of you that wants, that knows. There's a part of you knows that's not true. Mm. But it's only through learning and, and getting tricked by it all the fucking time that I realised and, and I mastered it. I mean like to a fucking T. Mm. I would know every little insinuation or trick and it will it won't like if you've got an addiction it won't just just by going I'm not doing it no more your addiction's not going to go oh, alright sound <laughs> well then it just won't mm. I had to stop drinking as well I went like I went six months clean twelve months clean four years clean at one point Um, but I was still drinking now and again and it was the drink as soon as I got and I was still getting lots of addictive voice and lots of addictive thoughts, but I was batting it off and batting it off and batting it off. And in the end, my counsellor said to me, you're going to have to stop drinking because as soon as you drink, mm. in the end, you're going to end up using again. Yeah. And so I did. But the technique I learned was just like about separating but, yourself from that voice and learning to <clears> recognise <throat> that, that all that is, is a, is a part of, is your addiction, a, that strong part of you. That's using your voice. It sounds quite complicated, but it's not. yeah. You know, it's like that little devil and the angel. Of course it is, like, yeah. <laughs> but what you, what happens is, your addiction will use. Well, you can't use anyone else's voice. It's not gonna fucking come out like a fucking lad from St. Helens. Hey, Lee, fucking boxing's on Saturday. <laughs> Fancy getting a fucking couple of bags? You'll be on by eleven. You're not gonna fucking go mad again. Fucking your bird sounds. You're fucking back on board now. Have a couple Saturday. It uses your voice, so you can think it's you. Yeah. You can get tricked very easily by these very clever fucking. Th- addictive thoughts and voices mm. and it can talk you into it and, and I like anything once you start interacting with that voice and going oh yeah yeah I might be home I'll just go home by 11 yeah once you start like someone going to a restaurant and the chef starts talking to you about a fucking fantastic meal and you start going so what's the steak like and he goes it's fucking medium you there. change your what's mind with it? What you're gonna... and he goes well, I'm doing like chunky chip I'm leaving the skin on and the deep fried and fucking got this new pepper sauce and you go fucking go ahead love that mm. as soon as you start talking and interacting with that voice yeah. 
it, and it's yeah, yeah. Then it becomes more appealing, and that's that's the technique that got me clean. There's loads of people that go to AI. There's loads of people who do the twelve steps, and it works for them. But that's I, that's what I think is really important, though, mate. Like like joking aside, is, uh, like, we we could joke all like you'd probably have a million stories to say at the great nights out you're and stuff. And I don't think there's anything wrong in talking all yeah, the good times. Like, it's, it's nice to come on a podcast. Like I've never ever spoke about them all the times, and I've always been very I don't very think there's anything wrong in it though about. People listening and going, oh, he's talking about it in a, in a in a nice way there. But I can't say, I'd be lying if I come here and said, is there a part, do you regret it all? No. Mm-hmm. I regret where it where it took me. Yeah. And so then someone else said to me, well, would you, what, would you, what would your advice be if you found out like your kids were going out? Starting, starting to go mad. Mm. So I always say, don't start because that's where it took me. Mm. You know, like, I'm and not that, condoning it on any level, but yeah, I can't yeah. hide No, and that's what why it was and what it was like. That's why it's nice, though, that you've you've come full circle and you can say, look, yeah, it was good for a while, but actually, no, it, it fucking wasn't in the it's end. It's just you know? that I know the frustration of, of, of desperately wanting to stop and not being able to. And and having and getting tricked every weekend and, and, and your missus fucking, like, you know, I mean, I was in my mum's. I've been thrown out. And like my life was just shambles. I was getting emails mm-hmm. off the boss. I was like, you know, I was awake. I was on Radio City on Sunday, and I, I, I giggle and I laugh because I laugh and I, how 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 fucking insane I was. I was like, I was meant to be on the radio at twelve o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, and I'd still be in the house at seven o'clock in the morning, drinking fucking straight vodka, fucking getting stashes of cocaine from down the house. And I, people are listening to that and go, he's fucking what a horrible bastard he is. It sounds horrible, that doesn't it? But if I don't speak about it, because there will be people who are doing that. There oh, is people that are doing yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And like, what I'm, why I'm passionate about it is that you can change and you can and the, the statements of like, your life starts when you stop, it couldn't be more true because people fight with the fact and it's only their addiction that's saying to them, you're going to be a boring cunt. You're not going to be able to go out anymore. You won't be able to go to clubs. You won't be able to have a laugh. Fucking shagging all this shit. Fucking, <laughs> your addiction <laughs> will use anything mm. to make you stop <laughs> starting to try and get better. And so we'll use all them things, like you'd be a boring country, you fucking, you better go up with your beard. I mean, you fucking beard drinks, she hasn't got a problem. Fucking, it, anything, it'll throw anything at you. And I know what people, how hard it is for people to just break that you, fucking you know, just, cycle. You know, just on that, mate, you know what I feel really bad for? I, I met a lovely girl, mate. She's a really, really nice girl. And um, it was just after I broke up with a serious relationship and I met this girl. And I probably met her too soon after my relationship. But she was, she was a cracking girl. Her name was Jessie, she was amazing. And she she didn't drink. She hadn't drank for a year. She had she just had enough one day and thought, you know what, Pff, not not drinking. And I'm ashamed to say, it never like put me off. But I thought it had to be fucking weird that. And I thought it was weird that she didn't drink just because I was so indoctrinated into the fact of drinking. Everyone, party. everyone drinks. Everything. Everyone drinks. Friday, well, Saturday, Sunday. The thing mm-hmm. is, you just auto, people automatically link being able to have a good time with having a drink. And honest to God, yeah. the one thing I'm like massively and I, and I haven't spoke about. Lots of the early drug years and, and and spoke about them quite kindly in this podcast, but I've talked about them honestly. So I feel like it's important for me to stress to people like the best thing I ever did was stop drinking. Really, yeah. Honest to God, if there's someone said to me other than like your kids and stuff, what's the one of the best decisions you've ever made? It would be the best thing I oh, ever did. You know did. what? I've heard a few people say this. Honest, you know? I swear to you. But, but, but by stopping drinking, it meant to stop taking drugs. Mm. So that's that's a big yeah. So like. Yeah. I knew if I hadn't stopped drinking for good and accepted that I was never going to drink again, and that's the big, big, the big part of of getting clean. Like, there's there's different recovery groups. You've got AA, CA, Ad Action. You've got this AVRT, which is like addictive voice recognition technique. And this technique I did, and I'm not saying that this is this is true. This is just what my belief is. AA and a lot of these other addiction groups, they say that addiction is a disease. You've probably read that before. It's a disease, they say, and it's a day at a time. And tomorrow's a new day. Get through the next 24 hours. That was too daunting for me. I like, I don't want it. I don't want to have to carry it around with me. I believe you can recover. I believe you can have an addiction. I know full well I will never pick a drink up again in my life or take a drug. It's just impossible. It'll never happen. But I've never been able to say that with comfort. Even when I went four years clean, I always thought I knew... I, it was still had that still had that voice saying you'd be able to have a bevy at some point. Mm. And then what tricked me into into drinking again and, and then ended up with me taking drugs again after that length of time of, of being clean and sober was that voice saying to me, 
you won't go back like you were. Just have a bevy with your bird. And even if you draw the line, you're not going to go back to how you were. Look how you fucking horrible that was. You, you've learned now. You're never going to do that again. And there's no middle line with addiction. <clears throat> with me, I'm either, I'm in with two fucking five pound of King Eddie's around each ankle. Fucking wallop. Or I don't do it. Mm. There's no middle ground. And I, I say this on my post. I'm not judging anyone. There's some people that can go out, have a bevy. I'm not saying it's, it's right or it's wrong. But can go out, have a bevy, go to a rave, have half an A, go home, go to sleep, get up Sunday, after Sunday dinner, and they're in work Monday at seven o'clock. Hmm. I couldn't. I'm not aiming my posts at them people. I'm aiming my posts at them people who's fucking tearing their lives apart. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, it must have been harder for you. I'm not making excuses for you, but it, your your job is in and around all that. I mean, maybe it, it, they've got pe- people have got, but you've got more of an excuse. I mean, if you work nine to five in an office, you can say, well, just don't fucking go out. But your bread and butter is... No, you're right. And I think it's, you are in that it took me longer to, 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 get, to, get me, to get better than it would have. It would have. Definitely. Definitely. But I think it made me stronger. So now I'm at a point where I can honestly... I, I mean, even if someone come to me now and said, look, there's a the magic potion there you can take. If you'd have a fucking spoonful of that... You'll be able to drink again, Lee, and you'll never ever think of having a drug. I still wouldn't have it. Mm. I just don't want to have a drink. It's just nothing that appeals to me about it no more. It's just gone because I'm more organised, I'm more creative. <clears throat> All the things I wanted to achieve, and I say this on my posts, just trying to inspire some people to to realise that. Don't let your addiction blag you that your fucking life's going to be shit because it's fucking not. It's going to be unbelievable. Mm. Your relationship, your relationship with your kids, you do more, you, f- you spend you know, quality time, your creation, your ambition. Everyone's got creative thoughts and ambitions. It's just that you can't carry them out when you're fucking mm. off the rails till Tuesday afternoon. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember, you remember saying about blagging? Remember when we had Tubes on? Mm. Tubes off Soccer AM. He was, he was, uh, he's an alcoholic. And he was saying that, again, we just exactly what you've said, going into work. Like, and he's, Bla- blagging them all that he's all right in work and he was, he was having bottles I mean, of vodka and yeah. stuff and it just shows you doesn't it that that, that addictive voice can just say you'll be fine you'll, you'll be all right and don't and that's worry the and technique I learned was to be able to recognise that's why it's called addictive voice recognition technique once you can start recognising that voice trying to trick you you can start battling against it because unless you know what you're fighting against it's hard to win anything mm, yeah. so this technique gives you something to go <clears throat> hang on a minute yeah why am I why am I on a Wednesday broken hearted, feeling rough as fuck and promising everyone around me that I'm not going to do it this weekend? But I'll come Friday and thinking of ways how I can get on it mm. again. Mm. That's the cycle. And yeah. that's so common with so many people. And like, Have you ever, do, ever read the book Stealing Fire? It's, no. Um, it's basically it's a really good book, actually. And uh, they say that in the... Changing, wanting, well, humans wanting to change their like um, psychology, you know, through drugs and that thing is actually it's not behaviour to some extent, it's biology. So a lot of animals try and change their state. So like dolphins eat puffer fish to try because it makes them feel probably drunk. Elephants do the same with uh, a tree called marica or something like that. But it's weird the way that like that, uh, uh, that people we're always trying to change that state of mind that because we it's a so there's a but there's a book that I. That this, this guy who's, who's this technique's this guy called Jack Trimpey, and it, the book's called uh, Rational Recovery. And it, 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 it sort of it says what it is it's rational recovery, it's mm. actually taking back control yourself of your own responsibilities. And I, for me, that was more important than, than living with this disease every day. I didn't want that burden, I wanted to go, you know what, I want to, I want to, I want to take back control. And be in control, and and that's what this technique does. But there's lots of but lots of stuff in the in the book that's that's actually down to biology yeah. in the brain. There's part of your brain that's responsible for like breathing, sex, um, just like fire of fire of flight. It's just like all them them key <coughs> essentials, them like, key essentials, yeah, yeah. and addiction. When this part of your brain gets tricked into thinking that using using mm. cocaine is an essential part. Mm. and it, it it breaks it down as pictures of like the brain in it and where the signals come from and where this voice actually stems from it thinks it thinks you need it 
It's for and and about cocaine as well. It's when you mentioned that with in in till Tuesday or whatever in your back room. We all have these things of cocaine, uh, especially like Miami, that sort of thing of this like. Um, yeah, you know, big parties and yeah, like wealthy, really wealthy sort of drug that people are doing it like mansions and mm. you know. In but <laughs> it's far from it. I know. remember when that first happened to me and when people around me started taking coke and I I remember thinking like what the fuck and someone said to me it's a fucking rich man's drug innit I was like why are you standing in a fucking bog in Bootle fucking taking it <laughs> in the Sully's it's a fucking rich man's drug <laughs> do you know what I mean that was my thing obviously not nowhere near that but my kind of weekend was uh, Yates uh, Mert and then Sully's yeah. and then it used to go to the 05 at, like, when I was like 16, 17 got in a few times and stuff before it closed down but I, I distinctly remember well, a funny story. I, I don't know if I've said that on the podcast before, but one of the best things that happened to me, I I um, smoked weed when I was a kid. Um, I didn't actually smoke it. My mate poured it into a cup of tea. It's called a hash brew, and I drank this cup of tea and uh, went home. I was fucking super stoned and went into my dad's and I said, oh, dad, me, me, just, me, my tongue feels like it's um, it's fucking going bigger in my mouth. <laughs> my tongue feels like it's shrinking. And I, he was like, what have you took? And I said, nothing. And he's like, well... You fucking took something, and I was like, uh, uh, yeah. and I started flapping, and in the end, I was like, Dad, I'm sorry, you fucking, <laughs> fucking. Yeah. I just, but he knew it was only weird, and I was gonna die, nothing, and he was going, you fucking druggy, you this, you that, and proper scared me, and then from that moment on, I never, never, thankfully, never took drugs, but I, I remember the time growing up, and people then start smoking weed a bit, then, and then Charlie come on the scene, and then people, and it just progressively got, and then like you said before at the start, it's. It becomes an it's just normal gets normalized and and for me what and again i i noticed a big thing though where i thought like i, I tried to preach at first and say like oh you fucking shouldn't be doing that and i used to think bad of people who took it so many good people that take drugs do honest, you know what i mean honestly, and, you, and that's you, sort you, of you fall this, into what that. i mentioned before about this, this the stigma of addiction where yeah. people think it's a low life type yeah. thing but it's it's, it's I, not I feel me really, it. Yeah. people can very easily very easily fall into a social drug yeah. and ends up addicted to it. It, yeah. it, it. It's like, it's just like it's unbelievably common. And it's, it, as you said, it's every form of life. I'm getting emails from from, from guys who are going to work and they're the, the just managing to keep it from their boss. I'm, mm. I'm at it all day. I can't look at no one in the eye. How do I stop? Like, I desperately want to stop. I desperately want to stop. That's the key. The key thing is, which goes back to the, the, the technique you used, there's a part of the person, the real part of the person, the right, that right <clears throat> part of the person that wants to stop, but there's the part, their addiction that they're fighting against keeps, is in control and just keeps tricking them and keeps leading them to the pub or leading them into situations. The, the big thing with that though as well is again, which what I saw is, and again, you, I very stupidly and naively thought, oh, all, anyone who takes drugs, bad people, and you realise that's not true. What I've realised as well though, it's, 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 it's the, um, it's the surroundings you keep, and it's 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 very difficult, I think, to be being in a round of a pool or most cities, where you go on out every weekend to, to not do drugs. I think it's you've got to be very strong. I mean, unless you've never done it and you've got no interest in it, that's fair enough. But even though I've never took cocaine myself, I can very easily see how it, yeah. it's, you can. Do you know, know what I mean? I know it is. It is, and that's. That's why I'm passionate about trying to get the message across and, and opening up to people because I see people reading them in and relating to re, relating to it. Because when you go into counselling sessions or you turn into a recovery group, at first you want some ones with your counsellor. You, so lots of the time these counts some counsellors they've never had an addiction or they've never mm. used drugs before. But I'm, you know, I'm not saying that they can't help because of course they can't because mm. they, they, they've got like fucking degrees some of them in in, in recovery and, and counseling and stuff like that but sometimes just writing it down and, and, and reading it in, in real terms and, and reading the pain and reading the the, the the schizophrenic and the paranoia and and how much you're letting people down and the lack of trust that it brings into your marriage you know like how my missus stuck with me andy I, I, like <laughs> do you know like i was going out to work in the 051 on a saturday and coming home on tuesday morning mm. and like coming in absolutely wired and of course she just think you were a fucking you were up to no good mm. and I wasn't I was yeah. just uh, in parties round the fucking bend yeah. round the twist like <laughs> fucking chances of me doing anything make yeah. a fucking <laughs> chopper like a fucking tall pencil you fucking kidding aren't you <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the big thing I think what you do me which I think is, is really commendable 
because I've had it myself. I was I was bad with again. I didn't I didn't um, take drugs, but obviously I drank. And then I noticed, like what you say, one comes to the other, and with drinking, I started gambling, and it was okay and stuff. But then the the more I drank, the, the stupider the bets are done and stuff, and the and the bigger they got and stuff. And what I think was really good, what you've done, is the way you've come out about it, because for for me. I done something similar when I wrote my book and I, t- I spoke about it and it was just one day I lost ten grand in a day, and it fucking makes me feel sick and so embarrassed. And yeah. I didn't tell anyone for a long, long time. Yeah. And I think by getting that monkey off me back and talking about it, like you, you feel like you just, you know, you know what? Can... You, 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 you're dead right. And like, what people need to understand is the reason. A lot of the reason I opened up about it is one because I know I can help people, and I'm and. and well, you're not scared though, that's what I'm saying. When I, I was petrified to be, because I just, I felt so embarrassed and I felt people would be like, what a fucking knob. I, yeah, I did that, but I did have that feeling. But you know what? Opening up about it and talking about it is sort of put the final nail in, in, in the coffin of my addiction. It was a big part of my recovery. Was And I, I always say that to people. Is people like, people might email me and go, I like, blah, 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 blah. I just, I don't know if you can help. I'm, like, I'm going out every weekend. I'm, I'm doing it. I'm, snort, I'm doing it. I'm snorting in the house. My missus is fucking on the verge. She's had enough. Blah, 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 blah. But, you know, I, 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 I don't know what to do. I don't know how to stop. And, like, just offering them people. He's saying, I can't. Or there's someone who'll go, I can't tell me missus. If I tell me missus or me mum, they'll fucking disown me. And I say they won't. Yeah. <laughs> That's your addiction. Your addiction doesn't want you to open up. It does not want you to go into recovery. It doesn't want you to go to ad action. It doesn't want you to go to AA. It doesn't want you to make a move to get well, to get better. So we'll go, don't do that. Fucking don't open up online about it, Lee, because everyone will think you're fucking wrong. And, mm. Or don't, don't, don't turn for some support because fucking hell, you feel ashamed. It's not that bad anyway. You fucking, what's up with you? It doesn't want you to do. And people are amazed. <clears throat> I say to them, go home and tell your wife, because the reason you don't want to tell her is because you know if you tell her or you tell your mum or whoever it is close to you, if it's a young lad and say, go and tell your mum and dad, or they'll go mad though. That's just your addiction because your addiction knows. If you open up about it and you tell your wife or your husband or your partner or your mum, there's miles less chance of you being able to get on it. Yeah. Mm. Because they're on you. Mm. And it won't, it, it just literally shuts you down. It just shuts you down and just goes, don't do that. Don't tell them mm. that. Don't do that. I, I, you know what else though, mate? I think, and hopefully if people are, you know, do you think they're taking too much drugs or too much drinks and they want to get out of it and they're listening to you? What I also think is great is that everyone's got an ego and an ego can, can fucking be your worst enemy at times. And Absolutely. You know what I thought, which I think it's great hearing you because, you know, everyone knows you're in Liverpool and knows you of, of what you are and what you're about. So the fact that you're coming out doing it because I felt, not that I'm famous, not, but in Liverpool, obviously people might recognise me through whatever. I felt like as a motivational speaker, I thought I can't go to one of these Gamblers Anonymous meetings <clears throat> and there because while I'm on, you know, going around in schools, being this motivational figure, I thought I'm not going into one of these talks, uh, GA meetings and, and saying, hi, I'm Andy, I've got a gambling problem. I thought, how, is that, how hypocritical is that of me to do that? And, and maybe someone will tell someone or it'll be, emb- or, and I just felt this wave of, Embarrassment, and I can't do this, and I can't do that. And then when you see someone like you, everyone knows, and it's like, yeah, well, fucking hell, Lee's doing a club scene all his life, and and sees you open up about it. It is so empowering, mate, for other people to hear, I know, especially I know. young fellas as well. Yeah, and I, I and I see, I just see the amount of people that, that are getting in touch that need support. I don't know where to go, don't know where to turn, don't know who to talk to, and just, I mean, it, it, there's people that. Email me, like, I got a, a lovely email this morning of somebody saying, hi, Lee, I just want to let you know, I can four weeks clean. It's the first time in 25 years I've been four weeks. I've gone longer. Jesus. I'm like, um, my missus is, is looking at getting back with my missus. She said, you know, if I keep proving her wrong, and like, blah, 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 I just want to say thanks for, for that. And that fucking, like, I just, it just means the world it's to me. It, because yeah, yeah. I'm like, <clears throat> I just want people to understand that you can't, you can't stop. And you can't change. You can't change your ways. And your life gets a fucking mm. billion times better. You know, none mm. of the stuff I've achieved over the last four or five years or whatever I've done. Me raving fit stuff, that's going so well all over the Northwest. We're looking at branching it out even further. You know, the chances of me going to a raving fit class on a Monday night and bouncing <laughs> around, fucking kidding, aren't you? I had to tell you on mute in the house. Fucking like, scared to fuck. I defrosted the freezer because it was making a noise in ours, apparently. <laughs> 
Andy, I look back and I, I don't. It's hard for me to to talk about stuff and laugh about it because I feel like I'm doing something wrong. But it, nah, it, 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 mate, it, people yeah. need to see both yeah. sides, mate, because people. It's, but I, I, when I when I I could tell you the story about and this just sums the paranoia up of of what it was like. But I, I'll tell you it and I'll probably laugh about it. But I'm not laughing about. I can laugh about it now mm. because. It's hard. I just don't want people to go. Oh, he shouldn't be fucking making fun of no, stuff like that. No, but mate, like it's that, that thing. Because, though, what you're about real, to say though yeah. is, is those things, those stories that you laugh at. You say, "Oh, fucking hell, I think it was blad last night." Done this, done. Yeah, I've got one dead quick where I came when my relationship was breaking down with, with Alba's mum. I was fucking bladded. I fucking spunked a load of money. I was bladded. It was a Sunday. She told me to get in for me roast, and I come home and the roast dinner was on the step. And I sat on the fucking step eating this cold <laughs> roast dinner house. outside the house laughing. I started like FaceTiming the lads. I was like, hey, eating the fucking parsnip on the step. And it's, <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? It's, that's a funny story. But actually in real life, my life was fucking spiraling out of control. Yeah, yeah. And you know, it's funny with the lads and you're like, hey, fucking eyes funny. I mean, just wake up the next morning and I'll go over to fuck. The thing is, see, and and I look back at lots of my actions now and like, and I... I, I, you know, lots of it is your ego at that point. And you're oh, like, the lads with your phone. Yeah. And I was like that. I was, I'd be times years ago when I was like, completely like addicted. And like, my addiction was at its worst. But I'd be bragging to mm. so the lads of a Wednesday. Fucking Tuesday, I stopped, you know. Fucking still go on Monday night. Like it was, like it was impressive. Like a badge of honour. That, yeah. And that's, that's when your circle of friends are all into the same type of thing. Then it's like, it's like you're bragging about it and like it was mm. the worst time of my life that's where mm. you've just said that yeah. it was like i was in so much pain but my addiction had full control of me so it had control of my language as well so it wasn't actually me that was bragging about it, it was my addiction was was mm. a control of my language and was bragging about it and that's why i think it's all right to say about those f- funny I, times I, because I, i'll tell you something it leads right. on to the times that you, you about, real. about how how bad and fucking paranoid i was Right, off, off, off cocaine. And like, people say to me, oh, what, how would you replace the high now, Lee, of all them like big, bit of, like ease and, and like the buzz and, and stuff like that? And that's a question I get asked by people who, are, who have got an addiction. And like, that's the type of addictive question you would get asked because they can't see anything else other than mm. drinking and taking drugs as, as being the only high there is. And like, me waking up of a Saturday and Sunday morning now, especially of a Sunday morning, I got up at 10 o'clock after I worked all night. Uh, I've been working, done a gig, and I'm on, I've got to be at Radio City for 11. Me waking up, clean and sober, it's just the fucking best feeling in the world. And it sounds cheesy, but when you've been in such a fucking horrible, horrible place of like, in the house, on your own, in a room on your own, with just gear around you and, 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 and drink, hating yourself but not being able to stop and then you wake up on a Saturday a Sunday morning and I'm like going and doing my radio show and then I'm coming home and I'm having my dinner and my roast I'm saying to me missus what should we watch tonight we'll get in bed for 9am and we'll put fucking power on or that to me is fucking like just the best feeling yeah. in the world and then I'm up Monday morning I'm up, I'm up at night at 9 o'clock and I'm in the gym for half 9 and I'm doing a circuit and then I'm back and I'm in town doing a couple of meetings and it's an idea I had last week that I've set up for this week all them things bring such great highs mm. to your life that yeah. you look, you can get that far away from the way you were. That like there was a time I was in ours and it was, I don't know how my missus put up with me. I fucking never know. But I was like, it was like Monday morning. It was like four o'clock Sunday night, Monday morning. And I've been, I've been continually drinking and using since Friday. And I hadn't been asleep. And the thing is, if I had a little bit of sleep, I'd wake up and I'd just carry on again. Because it's still bad. Yeah, I'd still have to drink. My missus used to say, How can you be at it again? You fucking being asleep. You fuck, you've woke up an hour ago. You, you're hard at it. Look at me. Look at me in the eye. And I couldn't speak. I'd go, No, what, 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 what it is is, No, 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 no. She'd go, You fucking at it again. Fuck. And like, it's a, That's heavy when you're yeah. in it that way. Like. Yeah, listen, I just wake up and I just either still have some left or I just, I just lie. I just lie to her, so I'm just going to the shop, I'm going to get some milk, go to the shop, get a bottle of vodka, and someone will beat me by the shop, and i get more, go home. And she'll go, you're all right, yeah, I'd stash the vodka underneath my decks or something, I'd be swigging it, straight. And Jesus. I'd have stuff hidden in rooms, so she could be downstairs in the kitchen, and I'd be upstairs, she go, what are you doing up there, go on, come down now. But in the end, she just knew all the signs. Mm. So like, so it was nice, it was like four o'clock Monday night, Monday morning, 
and I'm in ours. I'm walking into the ki- back, out the back kitchen window into the back garden. I'm convinced there's someone in the back garden with one of them, you know them red um, lasers. lasers, lasers. And I'm like, I'm in my, bo- in my dressing gown four days into this fucking horrendous bender. And like, tortured, me mentally, mentally tortured, like thinking, the busy's in the garden. I've got the front pages of the fucking echo written. Billy Butler's son, <laughs> Billy Butler's son, a drug bust. <laughs> Radio City star in cocaine hell. I've got the, I've got, like everything's going through my mind. I'm like, I'm getting nicked. They're coming. That's, or, or someone's robbing me house. Someone's in the back garden. And I'm, as I'm stepping into the, into the kitchen, it's going off. The red light's going off. And I'm like, bastards. Fucking onto these. I'm onto them. So I'm like, some of the things I was doing was just like, Schizophrenic. Yeah, it is, yeah. Fucking, like, not normal. So I went upstairs and said to me, Mrs. Woke her up. Like, imagine how impressed she was. Oh, yeah. Half four, and, or like, Monday morning. Sunday night, Monday morning, Jeez. half four. And I was already on the naughty step hugely. She probably wasn't speaking to me anyway. Mm. And I've woke, I've gone, Dion, Dion. What, what, what? what? Shh, don't fucking say what that loud. <laughs> That's how paranoid I am. Don't say fucking what that loud. And she's gone, no, what? I got you fucking kill him. Shut up, you fucking kill him. It's gonna be on to you. Just, please, she's gone, I oh, don't start that again. Fucking be quiet. Please, please, I know I've said to you before, just come down because someone's in the fucking back garden. And every time I go and look, they're onto me, they've got a pen, and they're fucking shining the pen into the kitchen. And, fucking, and as soon as I step in, they're hiding it and they're getting closer to And fucking, please come down, I'm gonna go insane. I'm nearly crying. And she's like, I'm going to fucking. Sh- don't stand on step four or seven, they creak. I'm fucking wobbling down. <laughs> I'm going mad. I'm going insane. I'm it's going like insane. Billy Moore said his uh, fridge was talking Spanish to him. Mate, I've, fuck, I've turned, I've turned the sensor leaking off. I've turned, the, I've defrosted the whole freezer. I've flooded the fucking kitchen. I'm sitting in the room on my own. I'm just like, what's that not saying? That? I've took her downstairs and I've gone, right, be quiet. Someone's in the back garden with a red fucking laser pen. Said, and as soon as I step into the, into the back kitchen, it's going off. And look, and I've gone look, and I've stepped in, and I've gone see, see, and she's just that normal. She's just like, like a normal person. Mm. She just walks into the kitchen, and like the light, the reflection of the light into the in the, in the window, is it just goes off. So she just turns around, and like the fucking measuring eaters on the wall oh, behind me. So that. as I'm stepping into the kitchen, I'm covering. It's going off, yeah. The shadow of the measuring eater behind, and I'm stepping back out. And I swear to God, I was fucking doing that for about fucking three and a half hours. <laughs> in me, in me, I was just round the bend. That's mad, isn't and it? And I'm not laughing at it. I'm laughing at myself because it, it 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 makes me sad. Mm. That's insane. That forward, like forward. Did you did you not never feel like get, having a heart attack? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when you're just absolutely fucking <clears> snowed <throat> in by by addiction, it's just like you don't care. Mm. You don't, your priorities are just on this sort of time to get, all, get across to people. That but, is like, it's the best thing you can ever do. If you, if you are struggling with addiction, it's, it's like, it's like someone's give you the second fucking chance at life. I just like, but that, that's what's powerful mate, about your story is as funny as we can laugh about that. And it is funny. Those stories in context with everything else, it's fucking not funny, really, is it? It's not, you no, know what I mean? no, and I'm, I'm embarrassed, and I'm embarrassed by it. But it's good that it, it is in that context, mate, because you're now, and you're saying how, how happy and But you know, there's different life ways to explain the pain, and, like, you know, that's when I, when I write them online. I don't write them about them like that, but I will write about some of the fucking torturous, pathetic things that I've mm-hmm. done, because when you sit in a group, I did, when I went to Ad Action, and I sat in group meetings of a Thursday night with 20, 25 people for, like, four years, and just, like... Everyone from like fucking multi-millionaire lawyers to like young lads who fucking got nothing to mums who've lost all the kids and and, 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 and are like trying to get their house and the kids back who can't stop. Mm. They can't even get the kids back because they can't stop. That's how powerful it is. And like what you realise is when you sit and you speak to lots of people who've, who've got, a, a, especially a cocaine addiction is them stories, they don't shock them. Because all the symptoms are near enough all the same. Everyone in that group near enough has had them fucking schizophrenic, paranoid, mm. fucking horrible thoughts. So me telling them and looking back and, and, and laughing at how pathetic they are isn't me condoning them. It's mm. me explaining them to people yeah. so that they can go, I've done that. Because I'll tell you what, someone listening to this, who, if they've got a cocaine addiction, <clears> will, <throat> will just go, 
I've done that. Yeah. Oh, mate, I, I, I know. Mate, listen, we all know people are taken, and I, I know lads, and I'm like some friends, and I like, worried about them a bit, you know what I mean? And I know people listen to this, and I'm hoping people will. Um, kind of listen to this because cocaine it's such a readily available drug and it's so easy for people to take it and then and I think the big thing is to be naive and think that yeah I take it but I only have it on a Friday or I only take and it's like that kidding themselves again and I think mm-hmm. hearing someone like yourself talk about those little stories and they might just you know they might be in the car listening to this now and they're on their own and they can actually have a little serious moment and think actually fuck me I, I've fucking done that last week and you know what, Andy, the way you put it there is sort of is very, very similar to the way the book and this whole uh, addictive voice recognition technique is because one part of you will be gone. The addictive part of you will be gone. You don't need to fucking do it of a Saturday. Fucking, it's not really fucking affecting you that bad. You're not like, like Lee was fucking... It's not, like, it's not affecting your life or nothing. But if you can manage to, to overpower that voice with your own, there will be a part of you that's gone. Oh, fucking hell, I didn't go into work two Mondays in a row last month because I was fucking wiped out and I fucking, mm. the boss is on my case because I haven't fucking done this or this <clears> properly. <throat> and when you look at it properly, it is affecting your life mm. far more than you're, you're prepared to, to admit to because your addiction's just trying to normalise it with you. It's trying mm. to just make out that it's fine and it's, everything's all right, it's cool. But deep down, you know, you know, it's having the ability to, 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 to reach that part of you and that right in the voice to go you know what I fucking don't want it no more Yeah, and, 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 and I know it's there and I know it's affecting me and I'm not hiding from the fact anymore I'm going to fucking reach out and I'm going to either go and get some support or I'm going to open up to me missus or to me husband or to me mum and dad mm. or speak to someone about it because it's your life starts when it stops you get all the real real fucking positive buzzes of life mm. and that's not me being a cheese ball it's just like when you've been that bad Sometimes the small things fucking mean so much more. Mm. And again, mate, knowing people who've given up the, this, like, drinking and stuff as well, like this girl, Jessie, she's so fucking cool. One of the coolest people I've met. And I've, I know I've got a few friends who stopped drinking now. And I've heard loads of people say that when stopped drinking. They just fucking just enjoy, like, things a bit more in different ways. And, and you perform like, better, Andy, in everything yeah. you do. I, d- I agree, I 100% agree with that. I feel like <clears> on Mondays sometimes you're just, like, you, you're not, you're just not, you don't have that motivation you want. No, I, I always really find in the fine line between not sounding like people listening to me and going, oh, fucking hell, who's he think he is? He's fucking all right for him preaching that now, fucking where he was. I'm not saying it's... Yeah, everyone has to stop. No, type thing. no. Yeah. I'm just saying, I'm just looking to reach to them people who relate to it and go, yeah. fuck me, I, I, I'd love to stop and I can't. Mm. Because... Don't be kidded into thinking you've got no fucking well, mate, social life or you can't party <clears throat> or enjoy things because you you can't. Mm. You can't, but you enjoy them for what they really are. You know, like, I'm working, I've done, like, reminisce, Camp of Fairness, the old five reunion, the state on Saturday. I'm there, and, like, my performance in my DJing and my musical choice and taking risks with songs is, like, a billion times better than five years ago when I was coked up DJing. Couldn't look at the crowd. Couldn't mm. wait to fucking get home. And what sort of like performance is that? Mm. Yeah. It's yeah, not yeah, no. playing safe tunes because thinking, oh, I don't want to play that. That won't go down very well. Now I'm going, at least Adams, uh, go on, I'll drop that. I'll play the fucking acapella at the start and I'll go into something else. I'll get these singing here, fucking looking at the crowd, weighing up what they're doing, taking risks, playing stuff, going, oh, gee, I didn't need to play that. And just everything, your yeah. performance in, and that's just regards DJing, but. You know, I'm more reliable. It was when I was at me at my worst. I, just, I didn't care who I let down. Didn't mm-hmm. give a f- shit. We had amazing remixes for like at the time end dubs and people like that on a Monday. And like me, me partners who who, who, aren't, who didn't have a fucking drinking drugs problem would be like, Mac texting me on a Monday morning. I am picking up at twelve. I just go, not going. Turn my phone off. Didn't care. My last. Mm. It's mad, isn't it? It's like uh, it's, it's when you mentioned before about the DJ and. and you know, people like uh, the the only name that springs to mind is Avicii and what happened to it. I think he had a drink. It was it a drinking problem. Yeah, I think he it did. Was. Yeah. Um, is it pre- prevalent then in in that in those circles then with DJs and musicians and? I think maybe less so now because it's a career now, isn't it? Mm. You know, like like back back in like eighty nine, nineteen ninety one, you didn't look at like I want to I want to be a DJ as like something you could make a career out of. I wanted to be a DJ because I fucking love playing music and I was just massively passionate about it. Mm. And it led me onto a career. But now, you know, like, especially music production, you look know, like Avicii, for example, mm. uh, you know, he's just, 
I always say to lots of people message me saying, I want to be a DJ, blah, 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 blah. And I always say, get into music production because it only takes one hit and you're a fucking superstar. Yeah. You know, like Martin Garrix Animals, 17-year-old lad, has that one tune he's making in his bedroom, multimillionaire, mm. gigging all over the world. So, yeah, if you're passionate about DJing, go and DJ, but learn to make music as well. It's the one regret I have is that I, I never done that. Mm. Mate, I've seen with your social media and that though, mate, as well, what you've said, you've you've practiced and what you preach, like you're so you're doing all kinds, aren't you now with the with the reminisce yeah. and the brave yeah. and fit and that and it it approves that by you know, by controlling the addiction and getting on top of it and all that. Like your life actually has it's not as if you're just saying this for the No, for the good no, of it, it like. does, and that's all that's the only message I'm trying to get across to people. And if they want to reach out to me and by emailing me, then brilliant, I'll always answer them and I'll always give them like loads of good links, lots of stuff about the addictive voice and, and like a lot of that people are like, wow, yeah. So that's why I'm fucking getting sick every weekend mm. when I'm I'm crying on a Wednesday, but Saturday comes and I'm I'm thinking, wow, did I end up here again on Monday? I fucking said I wasn't going to do it. And it, it rings true to a lot of people. That's why I, I like, I enjoy helping people and going, look. But I do, that's the one thing. The proof's in the pudding, isn't it? And mm. I say that to people who like, lots of people messaging, go, me fucking missus is never going to take me back. And I see she will. But words aren't enough. Mm. I think the fact that people are seeing you now living your life the way you are and now things, you, the projects you've got going on and stuff, it is the proof in the pudding. It's like yeah, and I couldn't ever, ever, ever have done them, Andy. Mm. Never no. in a million years. And I, but, but I always had that creative part of me that wanted to do them. And mm. I always knew it was in there. Mm. It just could never, it could never come out yeah. because I was, I, I was addicted to, to using and yeah, drinking yeah. for the majority of my week. So, I think that addictive voice is true with drinking. Obviously, it's with the book, drinking, but the I mean, book, the, the book, rational recovery is is not just about drugs. It's it's written for drink, drugs, gambling. Mm. Yeah, like the, it, the, I, I was just pretty sure you will have had an addictive voice when you were if when you were said you were gambling that mm. will have been going. Just have another fucking. Just have oh, another. Yeah. You might win it back. Yeah. Just have another twenty <laughs> yeah. on. You know what? But I think, think now like big, yeah. there must have been a, another party that's going. You just fucking throw more money away. Yeah. You, you stop now whilst you're fucking you're down, but stop. You know, for me, mate, what it is, and it all comes back to what we've mentioned it, is ego. For me, I was always thinking, I'm fucking down here, and I know how much I'm down in my head. I fucking, I'm not having the bucky being up on me. I fucking get even with it. And it was always like my ego thinking I'm better than this. I thought, nah, I can, I can control it this time. I'll, I'll make just 500 back today, and I'll do 500 tomorrow, and then there's a grand back, and then next... I had these little mass, mad plans. Like you're saying, you're planning or you're putting yeah. Charlie down the house. <laughs> but, but, I had but plans Andy, in my head going. Andy, do you know all that, that, them, that voice that was planning all this stuff? Mm. Do you think now looking back, when you were, when these things were getting said, like, well, I'll do 500 tomorrow and I'll win that back and by Tuesday I'll have mm. this back. Looking back now, do you think deep down you knew that was bullshit? Yeah, I've, I've got I must have I must have done, but that I'm not listening to anything else though. You're just listening. To that. So you're getting run by your source of your addiction. And, yeah, and, you're not and, even and, thinking and of that. Ego to a point. <clears throat> it's easy you know, to in hindsight now say yeah, you knew I wasn't really going to, but it's not even there. It's it's just like, and again, massively, what doesn't help is, is the ale. Or for example, when I thought I had drinking soul, I'd be going right. I'll I'll have a bet, but then I'm meeting the lads at say four. I'll have a couple of bets at two o'clock on the forty at two and three. Sunday afternoon, the one o'clock kickoff, but then I'm meeting the lads at four. Right, I've had my bet, I'm up a hundred quid or whatever, boom, done. And I've had a couple of pints. And then you just think completely different about it with a couple of beers. And then there's a half four kickoff, right? And I'm I've had three, four pints now, I'm thinking, well, I'll have a bet because I'm already up a hundred quid, so if I fucking do this and Yeah. And then before you know, you're back to fucking square one because of the ale no. and then it's so mate, I, I, that was the that was that was the turning point for me. Was just ale. Gone. Was just yeah, nothing to lose on the big head. commitment to stop drinking for good, for good. That's what I think's really not tough. for a bit. We, Does we your not. missus drink? Yeah. She, all right. Yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, like, if people. Are, I've I've now I've I've now I completely accepted and I never ever 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 go back. I never pick a drink up. I never touch a drug again in my life. And I know that for a fact now. So I'm got no issues going to work. I go to work and I. You know, it's no point to hide in the fact that these big gigs I do, people in there taking drugs. Mm. Of course there is, but there's people <coughs> taking drugs at the fucking bingo or at yeah. the footy. 
Yeah. So it's not it doesn't mean because I'm doing gigs. Like someone fucking put a complaint in the other week saying I went to one of Lee Butler's gigs and I seen people taking drugs there. I'm, I'm a bit disappointed seeing as he's opened up about his recovery. I was like, fucking hell, do you want me to do fucking search everyone on the <laughs> Fucking take them off them. You know, like I'm not responsible for like yeah. if they want to people can do what they want. But Wait, on like, that, I'm, I'm I'm now at a point where my missus can drink, she drinks, she loves having a drink, she enjoys it, she has a laugh, she's a math for a mate, she comes home, she'll like, it, it, there's no part of me mm. that. Wait, what, what is that then where, have you found p- maybe, maybe friends, relationships are different with you in the sense they're like, oh fucking, I won't, can't speak to Lee or I can't go out with him now because I know he doesn't do it. And have you found any relationships have changed? Not really, no. No, because no, I've just changed where, at first, your addiction will be going, and you can't, you're not going to be able to go there, and you're not going to be able to go there, and you won't be able to do that, and fucking, you can't go there, don't do this, don't stop, just calm down, just, and you, there's no calming down, there's no re- reducing it, there's no, like, it, it, when, you've, when you're addicted and you're absolutely well in it, like I was, there's no, like, just cut down, that's mm. just a blag by your addiction to, 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 to stop you from fucking actually making the steps stop, but in the end, them things that, that were attractive to you when you had an addiction aren't no more mm. so I don't want to go to <clears throat> certain places that I used to want to go to because mm. I was only going there so I could get off my fucking key mm. not because I actually wanted to go to the place it's just like I knew they'd want to be at it and I'd go yeah I'd go there and fucking so your priorities change and you come a lot more humble and a, and a lot more I don't know just a better person I was never I've never been a nasty person or, or like I've always been very thoughtful and very like I'd always help anyone whenever I could but then parts, then good parts of you come shining through once you find yourself again, mm. and people around you. It's not just you that benefits. I say this to people who say like, "No, it's not fair on my kids, and it's not fair on me. I'm gonna lose my wife and my, and my kids are three and six, and blah blah." And I say to them, "Sort yourself out, and watch all the benefits just spread mm. to your family, to your work, to your health." You'll look better. You'll feel better. You'll be going to the gym. You'll be healthier. It's just like it's just. It's an endless wave mm-hmm. of like that ripple effect, isn't it? It is. It is that. Do you, if you and it, we, I think we've spoken about this before, but if in um, imaginary world that uh, there's a lot of talk about how to you know with drugs and making them legal potentially, and you know would that stop organised crime? And I know obviously you weren't involved in that, but from someone who's been addicted to it, would did the criminal element of it at all cross your mind? As in, like, so would you have been in a different position if you could walk up to Boots or some pharmacy and say, yeah, I want a kilo of cocaine, and then they'd hand it over to you versus going... No, I just... I just, I, I, I couldn't, for one minute, think that would be a good idea. No. 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 No chance, because, like, if once you're addicted, <clears throat> I don't see how it could be a good idea. No. Uh, you know, it's because I know it's, Portugal it's, have done it, but obviously not to the with coke with everything, yeah, yeah, have they? Yeah, everything. Are you you have mentioned it, this well, to me before? Yeah, I yeah, don't have it now, yeah, completely no, decriminalized. Yeah, get it up on yeah, Google yeah. or something. Now, they're not like you can't just walk into a boots and, and but you're yeah. allowed to, but yeah, it's completely legal. I can't see that out of that would make you take it less though. Can you? No. What is the trying to say it's an inconvenience having to go to the shop to get it or something? No, or like, no, no, I'm not saying that. <laughs> <laughs> fuck walking down the fucking I'll just eat. <laughs> Deliver who? Uh, oh, look, he can't find it now. Right Funny old thing. Uh, yeah, it's a. Um, by the way, Portuguese I'll, radical drug policy. Decriminalised all drugs in 2001. Overdoses, HIV, and drug related crime. We should put that link on the uh, on the on the things so people can interesting. Read it. I haven't read it. I, I didn't no. even know that. But yeah, and I, they, they're saying they're getting they're getting less crime and less HIV and. But less. from an addiction point of view, it matters. Yeah, surely it can't. Like, it, did you not see it? the thing on the? No. I mean, when you say it, it, it did ever look like a, like it could have turned me to crime, no. But you know, I robbed me fucking mum's <laughs> three hundred and eleven quid in one yeah. pound coin, so it's not far off. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's such a thing, addiction, isn't it? And I think, mate, honestly, it's mate, the whole reason I wanted to do, we said this before we started recording, the whole idea of me recording the podcast, it wasn't about views on YouTube, it wasn't about downloads, it was about me selfishly wanting to speak to inspiring people who've got interesting stories, who I can take a lot from, and hopefully people who listen to can. 
And I think this is a podcast which more than most have its own with me personally. And I think a lot of people will because, mate, there's a lot of people out there, including myself at times when I've gambling in the past, <clears throat> who are just blagging themselves. And I think he- hearing, you know, you just talk so openly and honestly is one of the reasons we always talk about doing the podcast, just to get open and honest people who have been through the mill of it, come out the other side and can say, look, you know, you take from it what you need to, whatever, but this is what I've been through. And, mate, it is massively inspiring, mate. And I'm, 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 I know, I'm and buzzing I, to I, hear. I appreciate you, that. You're doing it means well, a lot mate. to me. And- and what you you sum it up so well because that's all I'm trying to get across to people is like you know this, if there is a part of you that you know is there that's going deep down I should fucking don't want to do this no more reach down and get it reach down and get it and make it stronger because you can fucking stop because it's that that right in a voice that wants the best for you that's got your back that always will never. You're right in the voice, will never give you a bad decision. You're right in the voice, your best mate, it's always got your back. It, you know, you, you're in a party at six o'clock in the morning and you, and you go to bog, you're in a sit off and you've been fucking drinking and using drugs and you go up and there's fucking all lads and girls downstairs and the tunes are on and you go to bog and you look in the mirror and you look and you go and you're right in the voice goes, the fucking kid are you. Go home. Mm. Go home, Lee. Mm. It's eight o'clock. Your bird's gonna fucking do you in, mate. Mm. You've done it again. Go home now. And then the other one goes, Fuck, there's loads left downstairs. <laughs> you've, you've stayed out now. You fucking, you may as well carry on. Yeah. Just go back down. It's it's finding that part of you that you've just said, if there's part of people who are listening that go, I wish I could stop. Mm. Don't be scared to fucking say and that. And I'd never heard that before. Don't be mate, scared to um... say that. Don't be scared. And that's the best way I can sum up yeah. them two voices is that looking in the mirror at that time and one going, fucking go back down. You, fucking, you may just crack on. There's loads left down there. Just go on tomorrow. You're out now. And you're the one that goes, you shouldn't be doing this, mate. You fucking, you know what this is doing. Go home. It's, I've it's, never heard it explained to me like that. Like that, that type of recovery. It's, mm. it's getting your right inner voice more powerful than your addictive voice. And you can and it's such an amazing feeling when you do because your whole life just clicks back into place and all the shit that your addictions caused, it can fix itself. And I say this to people and I speak to people who, who, are, who are getting clean and are getting even four weeks or six and eight weeks, you stay in that, in that, in that short space of time. Mm. You watch everything just start nah. getting better. It's just like... You know what you are blagging now? What? Getting in the gym on a Tuesday and Thursday. I know, lads. I know, mate. <laughs> you need Slack, to start coming down our gym a bit more, I know, lads. I know. Uh, mate, can we talk about... Um, what you're doing now because I feel I know we've spent a lot of time on that but reminisce the radio everything yeah so you know obviously we went right through Clubland didn't we we went like the state 92, 95 I left the state in 95 96 I was at the buzz for 12 months and I was never really into the buzz did you ever go to the buzz? Mm. Bit, bit, bit too early for yeah, you yeah bit too early yeah. for me so it was in the buzz and then I went to the 05 one I was, that was there for 10 years I think that's shut in 2006. Yeah, I think I yeah. must have went 2005, 2006. Yeah, so when that shut down, I was just doing gigs and bits and bobs and I had just this absolutely burning desire to do an outdoor event and I had it for a long time. Um, and obviously, once I started getting better and more, you know, cleaner and, and the idea became stronger and stronger. So we initially, we were trying to get it on Otterspool we couldn't get the license it was just too messy so we ended up going to Shirley Park and with the team I have with, with Steve my partner and, and, and our amazing team that we've got of just family and friends we managed to do the first one in six years ago and it's just like it's just grown and grown and it's grown out of passion it's just like it's our baby we absolutely love it and it's so important to us that people I just get so offended I get so upset when people don't like have a good time, it just really means a lot to me. And I'm like that about my gigs. And like, if I see people writing the next day that they haven't enjoyed it or they haven't had a good experience, it fucking like, it really upsets me. I'm, mm. like, I don't mean like, I want to, I really, I take into, into putting stuff on it. The, the biggest reward you can get for it is, is that people enjoy it. Mm. You'll get money after that. If you put your heart and soul into it and, and the punter enjoys it, there's loads of gigs I've done. I haven't made a bean, but everyone's gone away and gone, that was fucking unbelievable. I know further down the line. Yeah, you get it back. That, yeah. That's yeah, going to yeah. come good for yeah. me because 
I was never in the past in a position to tell you whether it was a good night or not. People, I get up then like Monday and start looking on, like, on social media because I've just about come round or Tuesday. People who go on sound system and shit, that went off. Fucking loads of two, two, two young, loads of snarlers in the corner. And I go, honestly, yeah. Mm. I wouldn't know. Now yeah. I take in the events, every fuck, every drip of passion that happens in there, yeah. I'm on it. I think you put on Instagram that when it was in, obviously this summer, uh, was it September? Time? Yeah, yeah, September yeah. the 7th. But you said something about the when you were there, the uh, when you played, it was one of the best... Uh, times you've ever played I'm sure it was yeah it was I put a clip up of me jumping on onto the actual onto the decks next to the decks when I was was playing the tune and I basically I I put I put it up for two reasons just to to show people look this is me without a drink having an absolute ball and two it's it's just it's grown so well we're just that proud of it and like we've got you know we've got big plans Big. When I say that, it's like we're always pushing, always wanting to go forward mm. with it. We could have rested on our laurels and like we was 2000 the first year, then three and a half, then four, then six, then nine, then 12, then 16 this year. Just gone. And like, it's just, it's 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 stressful. What? And like, we do need, we need more days. It's people, you know, that old classic person, the average person, they're walking you, walking up reminisce, walking money you must have. Walking <laughs> out, walking out, walking out, walking out, walking out, walking out, walking out. You're burning your ass on the light bulb. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I swear to God, it's the stress, the, the fine oh, line yeah. between reminisce, earning and losing is just marginal. You have a yeah. day of bad weather, thousand less sales, and a poor bar, and yeah. you're losing money. We but, had we had Dan Nico on the lad who's behind all the boss nights and stuff, and he was saying about when you try and put an event on the flight, the, the risk that you get. When he put that boss night on in the Echo Arena, he was saying like they were putting people lose mortgages, like houses were getting lost. Like the, you know, if it didn't go, the, the ticket sales weren't quite what they'd expect. Honestly, it's, it's just such a fine. It's a it shit cost, it in the fan. It costs us nearly a million quid to build that because it's, you're building it from nothing. You haven't got anything on there, no power, nothing. So you're building the whole thing, all your perimeter fencing, your double steel shields, your, it, it's everything. It's like it's just ridiculous. But our plans are for another night. You know, Friday this year. We're open to do a family day, so we're open to do this rave royalty thing. Reminisce presents rave royalty. Bring your princes and princesses to the first rave. So oh, we want to do like a slightly smaller version of. So we maybe use the main big top and two other arenas, and we're looking to get Louis, little Louis, to do one of mm. the arenas with his forever young, um, and have the fun fair open, and have like a, a family Friday there, which will just help us mm. use the use the site a bit more. Mm. Yeah, we're going March this next year. We're going to the Victoria Warehouse in Manchester, and loads of people are like having a little moan. Um, you get that everywhere though saying how come you're doing it in Manchester but the thing is we're trying to push the brand Yeah, you know like it's pointless me doing a big reminisce event in March in Liverpool because I'm doing events all the time here mm. it should be like another one of my events yeah so we, we, like, and the, the Victoria warehouse is amazing it's like proper industrial old warehouses like for 5,000 so we're doing that in March it's not where they do warehouse project is it no no, 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 no. no. not far and it's very similar yeah, yeah. Um, so what's, what's the biggest gig you've ever played like Probably the reminisce last year. Yeah, I mean, and that—that's amazing. Thing is, what you've created. We can't that's can't a get a bigger top than the main one we've got now. We've got like the Jippos bring the big tops in, and they're the boss. They yeah. put them up like this big top, a tempo big top up for like ten thousand people in the bar, six hours. <laughs> <laughs> Must be a special feeling, mate, to know that that's what you've created. I mean, I, mean, I have it on a very, very small scale when I do it. I, I don't want where I invited the, like 40 or 50 people come to Rocket and Ruby on, on, on Dale Street when I've done a little talk and I felt buzzing that I've got like 40 members of the paying public to come it doesn't matter how many's there though it's, but, it's, but I'm, it's, for me it was such a thing the reward and, it's yeah. the reward you get for me so for you mm. mate it must be so especially to know your journey you've been on as well mate both is, professionally and personally it is and you know what like I've always said like I suppose long, like years ago years ago when you've still got that bit of ego you don't you want to take the credit for everything yourself and you, you want to go yeah I've fucking done this and I've done that and it's just not the case Look, the team I've got I like I could not do it without and I'll always say to anyone who's starting out and trying to put events you've got to have a good team around you mm. you've got to like be have a really good gang of honest people around you because I couldn't do it without them no mm. chance it's just like I'm the I'm the public figure of it and obviously it's 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 my baby and and but I've got a team of people and a partner who's just like yeah. Who's doing like health and safety risk assessment, traffic dispersion? Mm. You know, like all There's so much to think. Have you have you watched Fire Festival on Netflix? No, yeah, I haven't watched it. Good, you, you yes, need to watch brilliant. That, mate. But just shows you all those things that you don't think of that need control. The thing is, with me partner, he's like, 
his attention to details just unbelievable. There's things that are like, oh, it doesn't matter, Steve. He's gone, no, no, we're not doing it unless we do that. And I'm like, no one will notice. He said, well, I will. So, yeah. And that's mm. why it's become as as as, as loved as it is. Mm. Oh, mate, it's a proper mainstay. People talk people about it. People say to me, oh, stuff, oh, like... don't do the Sunday. And I say, fuck, have you seen the fucking state he is when you just get off at 11? <laughs> <laughs> no way, no one's coming back Sunday after that. It's yeah. just utter, utter party from like yeah. midday till 11. But, you know, we are looking to, we feel like now after six years, we're probably strong enough for that one day festival to be able to move and push the brand into it. Like we're doing the warehouse, Victoria warehouse on the 7th, which the lineup's amazing. There's three warehouses. Then we're looking at Dublin to do um, the race course in Dublin uh, next year in August, possibly oh. just smaller. Hmm. Start it for like three or 4,000 and then hopefully build and build and build it up. But it's exciting and the Raven Fit thing as well. It's just such mm. good fun. Yeah, it looks it's brilliant. Like, it's not being on the videos it's, look great though. It's built yeah. around the, the same sort of it's it's there's just there's a generation of people andy that like especially mums it's mostly mostly girls that are there's 200 like, like we we're in the floor on tuesday and there's 200 people there and four lads 200 people yeah yeah each one is like it's it's insane wow. i don't know is that it was that big yeah it's, it's amazing and like next week we're in warrington in par all and then we're in um tuesday we're in Runcorn, and wednesday thursday we're in walton and then and how often are these on then if people want to Three go to four them? times a week all over the northwest but it's like our strap line is it's a workout that feels like a night out and there's a generation of people that don't get to go out no more yeah and there's also a generation of people who have got a bit especially girls and women who might have a couple of kids and they want to get fit and healthy mm. but they, they feel uncomfortable stepping into a gym so lights off smoke on lasers on and a hard workout the girls the instructors are like it you can go as hard as you want there's people coming in if, with fitbits on who are like who are into their fitness the steps and all that yeah and calories right and, and they're doing six or seven hundred calories in the hour but there's other ones who come who can't keep up with the instructor who just have a ball with the mates and yeah. just dance and they're still burning a couple of hundred yeah. it's about having fun mm. and getting fit and i think the fact that it's it is about having fun and getting fit that makes it so accessible and and like you're getting an hour's worth of like all them big tunes from the yeah. 051 and the state and, and and all that and then you're getting the feeling of like a big sound system and lasers and smoke and you're getting a workout as well yeah. so it's like there's it's not slightly social there's a social element yeah to of it. course yeah i mean there's nothing better than a song to take you back to i always remember remember that song by uh it was out in the summer it was that uh what's the guy who sings really was it twisted the one who sings dead quick and he's like Da, 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 just got paid, stacking up. Is that the old oh, song? Be on my way. Da, da. What were the lyrics drawing to? Um, <laughs> it was an old, an old song, but like a rapper brought it up. Sing uh, it again. Um, <sighs> not like <I> sing <laughs> uh, that. Like um, stack. Be on my way, stack. Uh, anyway, we're not gonna get it. It was the summer that I uh, left school, and I had a Saturday or like a little office job or something. And I was on like it was on Vauxhall Road. I was on 150 quid a week. I was on. Felt like a fucking millionaire, and that song was on. And I was in town every Friday, like buying new club and new. And that song was on. And every time I hear it now, it just it takes, takes me back to that song. As I said earlier on, music's got that amazing ability to put you back, not only in a certain it put places and times and yeah. people and clothes. It can, it can, it can, it can, it can paint such an amazing picture. Mm. One tune can put, can tell you what you wore, what you had on, who your mates were, who you were seeing at the time. Yeah, hundred percent. Everything, what nightclub you were in, where you stood in it. Mm. You know who the DJ was. It can just one one song can paint such an amazing Special, picture, isn't it? and like that's. What's I, I see a lot on your on your Instagram or whatever going on um, some of the old um, nightclubs that obviously are no longer in. Derelict. Yeah, I'm just obsessed with can, like. Can you, is there is there a sense like? Can you, I suppose the smell's long gone, isn't it? But is can you like? I bet it's weird being back in somewhere that. Walls could yeah. talk type thing. Yeah, and you can yeah. just yeah. I mean, we do. It, yeah. We're very lucky to be able to get the state. So we were in the state last week, and the state's got a summer like Letter to Brezhnev was filmed there. Frankie Ocean Hollywood shot their videos there in the eighties. All the rave scene was there in the early nineties. But that shut down for the same reason. People go, it's fucking violent today, and terrified of it. But, but it, like, you know, the shootings at the state. The door got shot at. The buzz was the same. There was guns and everything in there. There was massive violence in the state. It got shut down in ninety five or six. Um. But going back to them places, for me, is just like, it's all right doing a reunion in another venue. We did the 05 on reunion in Camp of Fairness a month, like three, four weeks ago. It was one of the best ones we've done. We managed to finally get all the DJs, so Dave Graham done it, Pez Teller done it, Steve McGee, Mark, Cy Edwards, JFMC, all like 
the original lads well, going Jeff, sure. yeah yeah I understand the word he was saying <laughs> talking about smoking spliffs mate you won't have smoking fucking I had the flat on the top of Bolt Street you know where Smithies is now yeah yeah we had the top floor flat and I was around the bend 96 and he used to come back afterwards and it's just like 7 o'clock of the morning just a huge big, oh yeah man <laughs> you want a bit, Lee? I'm going, oh, Jerry, fucking hell, mate. I'm just stoned off the smell of it. <laughs> what was the one after the 05 one you used to go to after the, um, after the 05? Sunrise. Sunrise, that Sunrise was it. Sunrise yeah, yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Upstairs, yeah. And he ever went to the 05 maybe three or four times, I think. I was like, must have been 16, 17. Yeah, you, you just missed it. You just missed How I got in, like, fucking never yeah, know. loads got in then. Yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, but getting back into, into original buildings, just like, uh, uh, so we're dead blessed to get the state, which is why... When we do it, people are just like they just just stepping back in there. Mm. It's just it's a ballroom as well as a listed listed like building. All the walls are like memorials on the wall. It's gorgeous. I've tried for the O five one. There's nothing more. If I park my car there every day in Eric's car park, right opposite, and it's standing there, sitting there, and not doing nothing. And it's shut down obviously because um, it's it's going to be students accommodation, but. Like, it's just there. So I've been waiting for the shutters to go up, right? So the shutters keep going up, but they, they, they vote the phone and the, you know, the people working on the masts above, mm. they're in there, but they tie. It's when they go in, up through the doors, they chain them up. So it was open the other week, about four weeks ago. I, put, I climbed under the shutter and I rattled the doors and he had the chains on. So I gave them a good rattle and then shit myself and ran out. <laughs> ran around the corner and all come out. So I went back and I shook them again and the chain bounced off. Really? So I opened it and went down there and it's like... It's near enough, so I found I got in touch with the people who've got it at a company in Southampton um, and begged them, mate. I just like threw everything in the uh, every everything you could put in the mix to sign Bender's here. I did, oh, everything I said, we'll do it for charity. This, that, the other, we'll go live on Radio City. It's a little showcase for the family. It was just like, I think what's happened there is there's a um, what is it when there's something in there and it's dangerous. Asbestos. asbestos up in the sunrise right mm. and I think the people who've got it aren't paying no rent or rates because they're saying it's unfit oh, and as soon as nice. someone does anything in there they have to start paying they'll go yeah, and go yeah. so uh, I've tried everything to get it but I was in the Grafton <clears throat> you've probably seen the picture I put, I put some um, <clears throat> pictures of the Grafton up I was in the Grafton and you want to see it in there it's like stepping into a complete time warp is it you, you probably never went did you no it's just I only went what? once or twice. I heard all the stories like if you go on my website, um leebutler.co.uk, there's a blog there about the Grafton. Look at the pictures. I love that saying that uh, that famous flag Grafton. that they took to um that they took to uh, Istanbul or, or Turkey and it was the Liverpool flag and oh, it's remember uh, that, yeah. You think this is hell tie the Grafton on a Hello. Friday night? This here. This video. There's a video there, you can watch that if you want, yeah. There's uh, pictures on my website like <clears throat> It's still all the same, yeah? That's exactly yeah. the same. It just has not changed at all. It's just hasn't changed a bit. It's it's crazy. It's just like it was like when you went back into the grafting, it was just like stepping back. I only went twice. It wasn't my bag really. But do you know what? And, and literally they just shut cl close the batters or yeah. uh, shutters yeah. and the old DJ it box is exactly like it was. It's like this big old mixer in there. So we're trying. We're trying to get a, a, the license sorted for it to get it back open to just, just oh, to mate, do that'll, a one off. That'll be an interesting one. I that, know. Going to just that. to do a one off. But we're not going to do it probably like a 70s, 80s, 90s type mm. vibe with a bit of disco and a bit of pop and bits of Tiffany. You think we're alone now and just mm. a bit of cheese. But it's just something special about going yeah, back totally into them. Man. That's why I'm like, I'm always looking to get back Did into it. Did that smell the city? Like, was there a smell? Was it yeah. the smell of just oldness? No, or like, it's no. just got that vibe and the state's the same. It's just got that. Just like almost the smell of history mm. inside yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Right. Listen, mate, it's been an absolute. How long have we been on for here, Tom? One hour fifty. Bloody hell. Goes quick, doesn't it? Oh, that. Mate, honestly, right. mate, it's been a real pleasure, mate. And uh, like I said before, mate, it's a, uh, it is a massive inspiration, mate. And I think you probably. Right. Thank you, It's one of those things, that. mate, that you're. Uh, 
you know you could you could put a post up you can do a podcast or you can you could do a you you won't ever know how many people you're helping do you know what i mean no i know i know and you know what i, I appreciate coming on and having the opportunity to talk about it differently because it's when i'm talking about it myself mm. it's it's difficult to to talk about them all the times and i hope I hope people listen to it and, and look back. I'm just being honest about them and, and honest about them early times and then what I would look back at good times. Um, it's pointless me lying and saying it was all horrible because it wasn't. Like, you know, it wasn't. We're, we're just, you know, a couple it of led minutes. me. To, it yeah. led to a horrible place, and that's all I'm trying to say to people is like you can change and you can do it and you can you really really can. It's a couple of mates just being honest talking, mate. And I think the way you've said it, mate, you, you know, you've 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 not bigged her up, mate. Again, like like anything in life, though, there are good times, bad times. The fact is, mate you've put your story across and hopefully people will take from it what they will and if, if they see some you know comparisons in how they're living their life mate and like you say it just might be just that wake up call to one or two people you know you just you just don't know do you no no but I appreciate the chance to come and, and talk about it because I haven't had that opportunity to speak about lots of the memories and lots of the good memories and, and where their memories sort of the good times led me to really really bad place and, and, and I haven't had the chance to do that so I appreciate it I oh, know thank you so much anything you want to plug Reminisce next year. <laughs> 12th of September, we put our dates out, tickets out December the 1st, early bird tickets save you 15 quid. Manchester Web- website. V- website, reminiscefestival.com. I've just launched <laughs> my own website, leebutler.co.uk. Ravenfit next week, ravenfit.com. <laughs> any, any books coming out? That's it, not yet, no. no. What the butler saw will come out when, when I'm off the radio and I can't be sacked. <laughs> <laughs> nice Thank one, you, mate. Thanks. Cheers, pal. That's boss.